I would like to call the Wichita Public Schools meeting on January the 11th uh, to order. The Wichita Public Schools will be the district of choice in our region where all students and staff are empowered to dream, believe, and achieve. Would you please join me in a moment of silence? Thank you. Would you please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. Mike, statement about COVID uh, manifestation. My name is Mike Willamy, clerk of the board. This regular public meeting of the Wichita Public Schools is taking place at the North High Lecture Hall, 1437 Rochester in Wichita. Due to the governor's declaration of emergency and due to health and safety concerns that exist because of COVID-19, no members of the public are present at this meeting. This meeting is available to be viewed live by the public in the following ways. WPS-TV on Cox Cable Channel 20, the district's website at www.usd259.org forward slash WPS-TV online, and live stream apps for phone, Roku, and Apple TV by searching WPS-TV. After today's meeting, a recording of the meeting will be available on Cox Cable Channel 20 and the WPS YouTube channel. The agenda for this meeting was published on January 7, 2021 at www.usd259.org forward slash BOE under the BOE meetings, agendas and minutes tab. The news media also received the main agenda and a portfolio containing the appendices. Revisions made after publication but prior to the meeting were updated on January 11th at 1145 AM. This version is being displayed at the meeting. At this meeting, all board members, district staff, and presenters will identify themselves by name and position before they speak to assist the public in following the meeting. The usual public communications item that allows members of the public to speak at board meetings has been removed from the agenda. In its place, an email public comment item has been added. Information about how patrons can submit email public comment is included in the BOE agenda. Public communications will be placed back in the agenda when the public again starts attending meetings. There will be an executive session at the end of this meeting. The following procedure will be used concerning the executive session. A motion will be presented by a board member that states the subject matter and justification under the Kansas Open Meetings Act for going into executive session. The motion will state the time the board will return from executive session. The live broadcast of the meeting will not end until the board returns from executive session and adjourns the meeting. Thank you. Next item. Under reports, school board recognition month. to President um, Cheryl Logan, Vice President Julie Hedrick, um, and all of the other board members. Uh, I am Alicia Thompson. And um, I just wanted to uh, uh, stand before you uh, to recognize that January is the Board of Education Appreciation Month in Kansas. And tonight allows us to honor you, each one of you that are here and those of you who are online um, our seven elected Board of Education members for the extraordinary service that you give freely to our students, our staff, and our community at large. It has been estimated that a Board of Education member invests between 10 and 20 hours a week or between 500 and 1,000 um, hours a year to serve in this capacity. What our viewers may not know is that unlike your counterparts with the city of Wichita and Cedric County, 
each of you serve with distinction and receive no compensation for your time. And I can only imagine in a year where you are making the decisions on behalf of nearly 50,000 students and 7,000 plus staff members doing the most serious public health crisis in our century, that your commitment of time has even been greater. As difficult as this year has been on all of us, I know, I just want you to know that our school district is grateful to you for making this commitment to the common good, to the decisions that are so very difficult but so necessary to represent the interests of all of our students, to the committee, to the community that depends on our schools to educate our future leaders and employees, and to our families who entrust us with their children each and every day. We would like to honor you this evening um, with there are some pieces that are in front of you. And these pieces were produced as a collaboration between our milling department and our sign shop. They are, I want you to take a look at those. Those are the most beautiful things I've ever seen. Uh, they uh, are made, of course, with love um, to you. And I know you all have wonderful places where you'll be able to find those and display those so you can remember this school year in particular. <laughs> <laughs> like we're gonna forget. <laughs> you could just sit and reminisce. <laughs> I, I would also like to take the opportunity to share uh, the content of the proclamation. And if you look in front of you, you have you actually have that in front of you. There is a proclamation from the governor, and I'd like to just kind of read a portion of it. Um, whereas, and there's lots of whereases, so uh, we'll try to get it together here with, 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 with reading them. Whereas, the mission of public schools is to meet the diverse educational needs of all children and prepare them for future success. And whereas, the Kansas Constitution entrusts the locally elected school board with the maintenance, development, and operation of the state's public education system. And whereas, Local school board members are accountable to their local community for accomplishing the mission of the public education in Kansas. And whereas Kansas public school board members advocate for our communities, our children and our public schools. And whereas the member of Kansas public school boards of education are committed to providing an excellent education for every child in each community. And whereas local elected school board members devote countless hours to the governance of our public education system and success of Kansas children. Now, therefore, I, Laura Kelly, governor of the state of Kansas, do hereby proclaim January 2021 as school board recognition month in Kansas. And I urge all citizens to join in this observation. Board members, thank you for your service. If I would have my audience with me, if you would rise and let's give our Board of Education members a round of applause. My goodness, thank you very much. Um, this being on a school board is, is commitment to your community, but it's also a labor of love. And I can say freely with all the members on this board, this hasn't been an easy year, and we certainly won't forget it, but this <laughs> plaque will ha actually make it better because it's, it's very well done and we really, really appreciate it. So thank you. Uh, something that I failed to do before we uh, got too far into the agenda, and I'd like to correct that now, is I didn't have, because we have two of our members remote, we did not identify ourselves, and I would like to just pause for a moment and go back and do that so that it, our, our TV audience understands that we have everybody present. So would you start, Ben, by identifying yourself and your district? Ben Blankley, District 1. Stan Reeser, District 4. Cheryl Logan, at large. Julie Hedrick, District 2. Ernestine Crable, District 3. Mike. Mike Rohde, District 5. Ron. Ron, are you there? Could somebody check and see if he's uh, lost connections? Ronald Solis, District 6. Oh, I bet you had, were, had it on mute, didn't you? Yeah. 
<laughs> I, I been there, done that. Understand. And it's my understanding that you both received your plaques today uh, delivered to your homes. Is that correct? Yes. Good. Well, because they're beautiful, we don't want you to not have one. So, thank you. No, thank you. Next item, Mike. Mike. Continuing under reports, good news facilitated by Wendy Johnson, Strategic Communications. Good evening, board members. We decided that we would nudge back towards normal a little bit as we turned to 2021. And we are going to bring back good news items. They're gonna look a little bit different, at least for now, but there's too much really amazing stuff going on in this district to lose the opportunity to share that with you and with all those who are watching meetings. So let me tell you how things are gonna to roll tonight and then I'm gonna take my seat and you're gonna get all three items consecutively. We have a recognition for Bostic Traditional Magnet, recognized as a blue ribbon school, national recognition. We have state awards for CAFERDS, the, the Kansas Health and Physical Education Group. And then we have Magnet Schools of America, national recognition. Two of our three items tonight are national level honors that are coming to Wichita and the Wichita Public Schools. We have engaged those presenters and have created short video segments. So instead of looking this way to see your honorees come to the podium, we'll have you look up at the monitors. We'll share all three of those good news items. And then if you all have any comments that you'd like to share afterwards, you're more than welcome to do that. And as we go forward, if you have any suggestions for how we can make this more engaging for you or more enriching, we would uh, welcome your feedback because we have more than enough good news to bring to you each month and we'll plan to do, the, do so. So thank you for allowing us the opportunity to begin sharing good news with you once again. And Jennifer will roll the tape and we'll have three terrific items to bring your way. Good evening, Dr. Thompson and members of the Wichita Public School Board. I'm so thankful to be here tonight and share with you more good news from Bostic Traditional Magnet. In September, we were honored as a National Blue Ribbon School. This was such exciting news for us. Our students work so hard and our teachers believe that data reveals the potential in every student and we use that data to fill in the gaps of students who need some extra help and provide enrichment opportunities for students who are ready for more rigorous content. In November, we worked on projects that helped us show everyone else how our guidelines for success helped us achieve this wonderful award. Thank you so much for the opportunity to share this good news with you. Superintendent Thompson, President Logan, and members of the school board, I would like to thank you for the opportunity to present some good news to you today. Not just good news, but awesome news. We would like to present to you the Kansas Association of Physical Education, Recreation, and Dance, also known as CAFERD, award winners from our district for 2020. You see, there are some good things that happened during 2020. <laughs> Our district is leading the way in Kansas in physical education. And this has been proven from our wonderful quality physical education teachers in our district and our numerous award winners over the years. The individuals we are recognizing this evening were nominated by their peers and they had to complete extensive requirements to be considered for their awards. Without further ado, we are pleased to present the following award winners to you. I'm now going to turn it over to Becky Winner, who is the secondary physical education curriculum coach, to share those award winners with you. Thank you, Diane. The KFIRD 2020 Middle School Physical Education Teacher of the Year is Bill Schrant from Horace Mann Dual Language Magnet. The KFIRD 2020 High School Physical Education Teacher of the Year is Emily Mayer from West High School. 
The CAFERD 2020 Young Professional of the Year is Erin Carney from South High. All three of these physical educators make genuine connections with their students and peers, develop learning environments that promote respect and value for their students, and collaborate with their colleagues to make our district curriculum better in a never-changing world. We are so proud of our very deserving teachers. Thank you for your time and allowing us to present to you just a few of the amazing teachers we have in our district. Good evening, Board of Education and Superintendent Thompson. My name is Jesse Millen. I'm here from the Magnet Department to help celebrate our award winners uh, that won School of Distinction from Magnet Schools of America. Magnet Schools of America is a national organization based in Washington, D.C. that support, supports magnet schools from coast to coast. This year we actually have four schools that won the School of Distinction Award. Jardine STEM and Career Explorations Academy won their third consecutive award for School of Distinction. Allison Traditional Magnet won their second award. They won for the first time last year. McLean Science and Technology Magnet won their second award. Uh, it wasn't consecutive, they won a couple years ago. And Earhart Environmental Magnet uh, won for the first time uh, last year. We were supposed to share this news in April, but obviously circumstances prevented us from doing that. Um, but we wanted to have an opportunity to celebrate uh, our winners. It's a very prestigious award and it's not easy to get. So these schools have really gone above and beyond to demonstrate uh, their dedication to their magnet theme. Uh, in addition to School of Distinction, Magnet Schools of America also gives out award for Principal of the Year, and this one's really tough to get, because while there can be different schools of distinction, the Principal of the Year is only given to one principal in that Magnet Schools of America region. We have 11 states in our region, including school districts in Chicago, Minneapolis, Indianapolis, and other large urban districts. But once again, Wichita Public Schools was awarded the Principal of the Year Award, and that went to Vanessa Martinez at Horace Mann. Uh, we've worked with Vanessa very closely over the years, and I know her also as a parent because my children went to Horace Mann, and uh, I'm very happy that, that she was able to receive this honor because I know it's very well deserved. This year, because of the pandemic, Magnet Schools of America are not holding their awards competition. So these schools get to be celebrated not only last year, but also this year. But uh, we're sure they're gonna open it up next year and we look forward to uh, see seeing how many more awards we can win. Thank you to all three of those groups of, of wonderful teachers and, and buildings and well-deserved. And thanks to our communications department for putting together a video. We have missed good news because we have lots of good things, even in a bad year, going on. So thank you for going the extra mile and doing that, and I hopefully will be able to continue that with other programs in the future. So thanks. Next item. Continuing under reports, Service Employees International. Hey, welcome. Good evening, everyone. Dr. Thompson, President Logan, board members. Uh, Gosh, so much stuff going on, it's crazy. Um, I am just really happy about the uh, COVID-19 vaccine prioritization paperwork that's come out recently and it really, really makes us feel great to know that we're getting closer to the vaccines and everything. That is, that is awesome. Um, I did receive several phone calls today and I will try to surmise a lot of those discussions that I had into just a few moments here. But one of the things that uh, I think kind of embodies the uh, thoughts of a lot of the people I represent comes from a, uh, a Billy Bragg song called Power in the Union. And it starts out, there is power in a factory. There is power in the land. There is power in the hands of the worker. And a few verses later, he says, now the lessons of the past were all learned with worker's blood. The mistakes of the bosses we must pay for. Who comes to speak for the skin and bone, and what comfort to the widow, a light to the child? There's power in a union. Together we will stand. There is power in a union. And I think what I want to iterate here is that the voices of the many often just get directed through me, 
Um, but there really is a lot of solid sentiment here, and I think that this comes not only from our union members, but from parents that I've spoken with. And I will tell you that personally, um, I probably won't be sending my child back to school for the rest of the year, just until at least the vaccines and stuff are done, and we've already made that decision. And I know not all parents have made that decision. But as we've heard from many of our staff at this point in time, as close as we are to these vaccines, there is an awful lot of concern about anybody making a decision to return to school uh, either the 13th or maybe even the 25th because it's the end of January when phase two actually starts. A lot of people that I talked to felt like this was akin to you ever see anybody riding in the Tour de France and they take their hands off the handlebars and do this a little too early and then crash and burn? Well, that's what we foresee in this situation. And I know if you go and you look at the COVID Sedgwick County uh, dashboard, you'll notice they've squeezed the window down from August to now so you can just kind of see the, the climb that we're currently in. I encourage each of you before you make a decision to go back and open that dashboard all the way up, take it back to February of 2020. And what you'll notice is we have now complacently accepted what we thought was the top of the mountain last March as the baseline for which we're going to operate and exist today. Those numbers, when we sent everybody home and paid them for the rest of the year and taught kids remotely, we were around 12 or 13 percent. The entire summer, while the Department of Labor gave unemployment to the workers who were unable to work at their summer jobs, we were still around that 12 and 13 percent margin. And it was not until this fall when we started to come back into buildings to regroup with one another that our numbers went up. And then they went up again when people went home for holidays. And I will ask you to consider the fact that when we met via Zoom, or I'm sorry, Teams for the school district, uh, to, to discuss the superintendent's COVID plan uh, with the committee, uh, I found it ironic that we didn't feel like it was safe enough to meet in person. We met via Teams to make that decision. And I also find it ironic tonight that we still don't allow the public into these buildings for public comment because it's not safe yet. But by the same token, we're considering asking the lowest paid of all our workers to put themselves back in harm's way and to service the children of the community when we're this close to a vaccine. We're very concerned. I'm not standing up here saying no people don't want to go back to work, but I would encourage you to look at the timeline here and look at all of the data and not just the happy, simple little rubric that made it easy for us to make decisions. I want you to look at the whole picture and I want you to look at the cost of the skin and bone of the lives that are gonna be coming in and working in these situations. Because I've already had an employee at the city of Wichita acquire COVID and die. I have a step-grandfather who the week before Thanksgiving acquired COVID and died. So this is very real and this is very personal to many of your employees and to many of the people in the community. And I appreciate you giving me the opportunity to express in this much detail how we're feeling. So thank you. You don't have an easy decision to make tonight. And I hope that the governor's award uh, proclamation lessens the sting of what you'll have to do. But do understand you have a lot of concerned community members and a lot of concerned employees. And we're just around the corner from the vaccine, guys. I think we need to be um, careful as we proceed. Thank you. Thank you very much, Esau. Next item. Report United Teachers of Wichita. Good evening, President Logan, Vice President Hedrick, Dr. Thompson and BOE members. Thank you for all you do. If there's a general theme um, to what I'd like to share with you tonight, it is this. We are so close, so let's not mess it up now. From the very beginning, UTW has advocated that decision-making should be based on science and that safety always be front and center. Our teachers, our paras, our support staff, the students, and their parents all have responded heroically to this pandemic. We have teachers doing amazing and innovative lessons with their students remotely. We have students that are flourishing in this remote environment. 
Before Thanksgiving break, you all made the wise decision to have all in our district go full remote, with the exception of the most needy and vulnerable special education students. Since then, we have withstood a major surge from the Thanksgiving break, and yes, we are now starting to see our numbers come down concerning community spread, but many of our hospitals ICUs are still at a critical stage, and another 107 deaths were reported statewide over the weekend. Again, we are so close, so let's not mess it up now. We knew this meeting was on the agenda and that you would be discussing the possible return to face-to-face -face teaching, but in the last few days, the information that has been put out indicates that you might be considering decisions that could impact what everyone is doing as soon as tomorrow. Communications to parents and teachers suggest that elementary students uh, might return as soon as Wednesday, leaving teachers only tomorrow to pack up their workstations from home and get set up at school. Right now, we have teachers at home watching this meeting wondering what will they be doing tomorrow. That is not grace and flexibility. We believe that is not enough time for parents, for students, and definitely not for teachers. We've also been contacted by special education teachers who are teaching both at school and at home. They will also need time to move their materials and resources back to school. The second semester begins on January 25th, two weeks from today. Please do not make any decisions that would bring teachers and students back before then. By then, we should know if there is a post-holiday COVID surge, as the experts expect, and we need to see what the next few weeks bring. You could call a special meeting at that time to look at the most current data. So many of our elementary school personnel and special education teachers have lost leave time, been quarantined, sometimes more than once, and gotten sick, some very sick. And the move to go full remote has allowed many to recover and continue with their heroic efforts to teach their students. If you bring staff back to our school buildings, our quarantine numbers will also rise. We didn't have enough substitutes when it was only elementary in person, add secondary and the problem will be worse. Again, we are close, so let's not mess it up now. And what about the middle and high school teachers? In one email, teachers were told that all staff will return to their on-site work locations on January 13th. Why? Dr. Menz has extended the current Sedgwick County Health Order to February 6th, and it includes the recommendation that employers allow employees to work remotely whenever possible. Why bring middle school and high school teachers back any sooner than necessary? Why bring back elementary my school remote teachers? We again state unequivocally that if a teacher can perform his or her job from home during this danger, dangerous pandemic, that should be allowed. Grace and flexibility is needed there. The vaccine will soon be available to school personnel in just a matter of weeks. So many more will be in a much safer position. So my mes message again is the same. We are so close. Let's not mess it up now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kim. We appreciate hearing from both of our unions. Thank you. Next item. Under email public comment, we have received six emails from members of the public and the board uh, received a PDF with those emails this morning and the board president and superintendent received those this evening. The emails will be attached to the BOE minutes for this meeting. Next item. Under education, Verizon Innovative Learning Initiative. The following 12 middle schools will participate in the Verizon Innovative Learning Initiative. Brooks, Coleman, Curtis, Hadley, Hamilton, Jardine, Marshall, Mayberry, Mead, Pleasant Valley, Robinson, and Truesdale. The Verizon Innovative Learning Schools will have extended opportunities through the initiative, including always available access, Every student and teacher will be equipped with a device and data plan. Professional learning, a full-time school-based coach and blended in-person as well as virtual professional development will ensure all teachers are supported and successful in promoting student learning with technology. STEM opportunities, the Verizon Innovative Learning Initiative will provide students with innovative STEM opportunities and insight into STEM careers. Research. Ongoing research will determine how the program is changing teaching and learning. This presentation is for the board's information, 
no action is required. Welcome, Rob. Uh, Good evening. We're glad to have you here. Dr. Thompson, do you want to say anything before he begins? Sure. Um, we're really excited about this opportunity. I am not going to steal the thunder, um, but we have we were anxiously at our seats, uh, rocking and rocking when they said <laughs> that the date was going to come, that we would know whether or not we received the grant. And when we were uh, awarded the grant, uh, we we were in you know just a, a big applause uh, filled the the uh, the room when we found that out. So I'm going to let. Uh, my colleague take it from here and share exactly what this really means for our district. It is going to be transformational and we're really excited about it. Thanks, Dr. Thompson, uh, President Logan, Board of Education, uh, Rob Dixon, Chief Information Officer. I have as my partner in crime, Brandon Johnson, Executive Director, Secondary Schools. <laughs> um, I have this first slide up there because I think um, this couldn't be more timely for us. When you think about where we've been uh, one year ago today, education looked much different than it does today. We have digital equity and access. We're providing kids who need internet, internet, and we're, we also have the availability of devices to our uh, students. I think one of the things that's interesting as we start to look at coming back is what does that new normal look like? And I think, you know, for us, this grant opportunity, we started this grant opportunity in March of uh, la this last year. And so when you think about that whole nearly year long process to go through this, when we first initially went into the grant, we had no idea what was going to happen across the world during that time. So I think the outcomes of applying for that uh, have changed and I think we can use this as a, a new model for us to help us create what our new normal looks like. And so um, I wanna start off by saying thank you. I wanna thank the Board of Education. I wanna thank our district leadership, including Dr. Thompson. I wanna thank our principals at those 12 middle schools who are amazing. They did uh, such great work. Holly Wilson, who uh, helped us in the grant uh, process and helped us through this to get um, you know, all the items needed in a timely basis and those building leadership teams, including uh, Brandon Johnson, Diane Smokorowski, Kristen Ford, uh, Christy O'Toole, all those folks that helped us um, put into place what was needed so that we could apply for this. And so when you look at the benefits of this Verizon Innovative Learning Schools initiative, and you're gonna hear me not say the word grant uh, based upon what Verizon has asked us to say, that they, they, they want us to say initiative. Um, this helps us to really look at state-of-the-art technology. Um, they work hand-in-hand -hand with STEM Focus partners, including Project Lead the Way and ST Math, to bring innovative lessons with um, digital learning within the classroom. So think about when students come back and they have access to technology, um, today those students have been fully remote. We've never really built that environment of what pedagogy looks like, what the delivering of content looks like in a blended learning environment. Um, also building processes such as student uh, tech teams in which uh, you'll see it in the fall whenever we begin to deploy devices to students that's not on day one of school. Those students uh, and student tech teams that are built at those schools, they build a culture and a climate of owning that digital environment that's created from start to finish. And so that first day, uh, you'll see a lot of digital literacy, digital citizenship being taught uh, with our, our partner Digital Promise who helped write the national tech plan who uh, partners with Verizon in this initiative and is going to be driving professional development. Uh, you know, those student tech teams will have t-shirts that say Verizon Innovative Learning Schools uh, tech team. Uh, they'll be taught by a teacher and curriculum on how to support that school. Uh, whenever I think about a full-time instructional technology coach, that VILS coach, that's gonna be there to help transform what that delivery looks like for that school, there's there's an incredible amount of supports 
that we will want to replicate district-wide in some ways to help us define this new normal from especially what we've just now done over the last 10 or 11 months. And so when you think about research, uh, Westat is a research firm that will work with our research team to measure uh, other schools within the cohort. So we're in cohort eight. Uh, in Omaha Public Schools, I was originally a part of cohort five. And so you work as a community with your cohort. So we have, um, there's 111 schools in cohort eight. We have 12 of them. And so they'll work with Miami-Dade, several other schools that are a part of cohort eight, many of them in large districts, all Title I schools, to help uh, facilitate a community-wide and community engagement uh, within the Ville's community, but also within the local community within Wichita. Um, they drive real uh, academic improvements and STEM education. I talked about Project Lead the Way, but uh, we're even working with Kelly Bellafield to figure out how we might do that purposefully and flowing those kids into some pathways straight out of middle school. You understand that probably today, and I even think about my three daughters, the biggest transformation that I've ever seen them go through was that transition from elementary to middle school. They change as a person, they begin to understand an identity, and uh, you look at where exploratory education and practice need to go, it really leads there to where they know we're driving so many things into high school. And to help those kids have that taste, that, that toe dip into what they want to do, providing STEM education in those middle schools is a great way to help those kids explore. Whether that be through coding, whether that through, be through robotics, creating things, we're in a creation society now where, you know, kids create videos, content, you name it, without us directing them to, right? You think about TikTok today and all those social media platforms. We are a, uh, we're very immersive in technology. And so this project also aligns to KSDE's vision to provide real world applications, student success skills, personalized learning, and family community partnerships. And before Brandon talks about the schools, I want to read something from Verizon. Since 2012, the Verizon Innovative Learning Program has provided over $535 million in market value towards STEM education, helping under-resourced communities bridge that digital divide. The average market value of a Verizon Innovative Learning Program's donation to each school is on average $1.8 million. Brenda. <laughs> That's a lot of good money right there. So the 12 schools that you see on your screen right here worked tirelessly over the last year with COVID going on in the middle of a pandemic to put together many checklists they had to get through just to get through the application process. We changed principals at some of these buildings. We changed assistant principals at some of these buildings. We got new building leadership teams at some of these buildings. They all came together underneath the auspices that they would be successful following our guidance. Um, and we're really proud of all of them. They put together videos. Uh, Verizon Innovative Learning came into their classrooms and watched them teach. Our students got on panels and got interviewed by Verizon. We, did a, we had a lot of people in all 12 of these buildings really step up to the plate and do what was best for our community. We're really proud of them. And here's the thing that kind of is my role within this, which is helping the, the leadership, the principals at the, set, the middle school level. And Verizon Innovative Learning is going to work with Rob and myself and the rest of our DLT to, to provide wraparound services for all of our 12 middle school principals when it comes to, to leadership capacity in a digital environment. They're going to get PD from them. They're going to get PD from us as a district. We're going to have our coaches around them with our current MTSS coaches and this coach together. We're gonna combine our standard reference grading initiative, our Verizon Innovative Learning Initiative, and all of the PL that we have planned for our district together so that we have a streamlined product that provides our, our teachers with full, full service, not only from them, but also our principals and our secondary office. So we're really excited about that. I think about digital equity and access. Um, you all have seen the importance of 
uh, leveling the playing field. And we've been able to do an, an immense amount of that uh, over the course of this year, whenever you think about kids and access to technology and access to resources, access to the internet. Um, whenever you think about uh, doing that uh, systemically with a program that's designed around it. I think, you know, we really, we drove so much innovation because we had to, right? And I think this is a, a great opportunity for us as a district to take a look at our systems and how we operate, because I don't think we had enough time to do that. We were, you know, whenever you think about um, the way COVID hit and the way we had to advance, uh, looking at digital equity and access in a purposeful way around pro programmatically uh, within the school, how it functions. Um, this, this will allow us to do this at the middle school level, see those opportunities and replicate those both at the high school and elementary levels as well. Yeah, and then doubling down on the professional development, which is the next slide that we're going to talk about, this is probably the, the part that I get most excited about because when it comes to really great professional development, it has massive impacts on student outcomes. And if we can get that PD, not only with the Verizon Innovative support that they give us as a district and our coaches, but then also a full-time coach that is dedicated to this work alone. We're not gonna be pulling them to do other jobs. Their job is to help us implement these devices and the delivery of instruction in a different way so that we can become more effective and impact student growth. This will really give wraparound services for all levels, student, teachers, principals, and the district level as well, because we're gonna get our own providing services. Kristen Ford's gonna get support for IT. Uh, Diane Smokorowski is gonna get support as the PD person, and I will get support as a principal person. So we're really excited about this and what it's gonna bring for all of our students. Um, the other great thing about professional development is um, having professional development given even by those other cohorts. I think about because um, there's, there's now been seven cohorts before us. And so they all know they've been through it. And so I think there's some added value in listening to some of those other schools and like, I did it this way. Oh, you know, that worked well for me, but this didn't. And so there's, there's some professional development that's given just by peer relationships that will happen naturally in the community. I think that's something unique that you don't really see uh, you would see it within Wichita itself, but this community is literally from East Coast to West Coast. And so uh, you have, we'll have a, a breadth of experience to help us in those. Uh, when you think about STEM Act opportunities, I think, of, uh, I think of what coding, I think of what doing, you know, so much in school, we need to get to, to do to learn, right? And you think of kids and where we're at with STEM education and thinking about interdisciplinary activities, right? Whenever uh, I introduce a, a STEM program into a school, those kids are, are going to be utilizing not just one content area to complete something. It's very much project learning based. And so you'll see a, a ton of these schools begin to, to look at the use of space and time and schedule wise at a middle school and Brandon and I have had this conversation and I really think that's going to open up some opportunities to have some meaningful STEM projects that hopefully we bring back to you and showcase like hey this is this is real student learning I'm looking at this it's not a score which I think assessment is important right it's a good checks for understanding but if I see something there hey that kid dreamed that and built it that's amazing I think there's some some huge quality with that. And it ties into not only that, but we just saw a second ago, we have a STEM magnet school that just won distinction in our school district. This is a way for us to double down in that school specifically and how we utilize STEM within that whole entire magnet theme. This is a great opportunity for them. We have robotics programs that are exploding throughout the district that we can tie back to STEM to extend that learning environment. So it doesn't just happen in the robotics competition or the consortium class in which they get it. We want this to go home with them. The devices now have internet so they can go home and expand that STEM experience beyond the classroom. That's another bridge we're giving our children for learning because it's not just about the outcome of a grade, but if we can expand their learning within STEM beyond the classroom, we're doing them a great service. You know, another area that will be naturally expanded is esports. I want to give a special shout out to Southeast. Southeast, if you're listening, 
great job. They got uh, first place in League of Legends, first place in Overwatch, and third place in Rocket League. Those guys in, in the entire Midwest. There were in, in some of those tournaments over a thousand teams, and they beat them all. And so you think about those after school programs extending beyond the classroom. Those are the types of problem solving that we really need in order to build, you know, what our future workforce looks like. Research. Uh, like I said, Westat uh, will partner with us and work with our research team to both give us a view of within the VILS program, you know, across our cohort where we're sitting, as well as uh, it within the district. And I think, uh, you know, some interesting takes will be where we set in attendance. You know, do we have a higher level of attendance and engagement based upon higher engaging uh, programs that kids are involved in. So I think it'll be interesting to look at that. The impact is nearly 7,800 students. Those devices with internet provided by Verizon for four years will give these students activities and, and opportunities that I, I, I don't know that we've ever really come to understand yet. And I, I think uh, the person that replaced me in Omaha Public Schools was the principal of a Bill school. The professional development that's given to those leaders and building leaders uh, is amazing. And I would tell you that I've not seen another program uh, be as quality as what the Verizon Innovative Learning. I, and, and, and I double what Dr. Thompson said. I did not think all 12 would get it. Uh, but it's amazing to see what can happen. Timeline, uh, we've just kicked this off. Uh, there's planning in February for systems and infrastructure. We've got to get some, some things together. In fact, we're, we're a little bit ahead of the schedule right now. In April, professional development begins and we'll be tying professional development with our learning services folks to make sure that standards reference grading and Everything else common language is developed into it and it doesn't seem like it's something separate. And then uh, in May, staff devices will be deployed and then we'll plan in the fall doing student devices. It'll be a big day. There'll be a big Verizon Innovative Learning flag. I'd say every wall in that school will have some form of motivational learning poster within it. And uh, you'll probably see some very uh, executive type people from both Verizon and Digital Promise around the area once we, uh, once we get back to some form of face-to-face. -face. So, questions? I, I'm gonna start us off. Just, is it not, is a, the queue not working? Okay, go ahead. Ernestine? Oh, you wanna go before me? Uh, it's fine, go ahead. Okay. Um, I noticed when you mentioned the number of students, are there going to be only select students from each school or will all the students in that school have the opportunity? It's all the students and, and the staff. Okay, and so the whole staff, mm -hmm. even in the areas that are not STEM topics. Correct. Would some of the non-STEM teachers be able to use the STEM ideas to create and have students create within their like language arts or social studies or something like that. They could make videos or. Absolutely, I, and, and I'd like to bring up something. That instructional technology coach, one of their jobs is to help uh, meld that kids' learning experience across all of those content areas. So if I'm in arts or if I'm in music, you're gonna see a lot more interdisciplinary activities, project-based learning activities between there. So it's not just limited to maybe some of those STEM areas that you would think about in traditional STEM. It's really bringing a mix of So a student entire... could do a project mm -hmm. in, uh, let's say, social studies where they do it on a country and they include the music and they include the food and they make a video and, yep. I don't know, Absolutely. Make a robot tap dance. Uh. <laughs> well, when you think about when you think about standard reference grading, which is where we're going to all the way K eight, correct? When you get to a level four, which is mastery of a subject content area, that's actually where we want students to create their own type right. of assessment, 
And that's what we're hoping to do is to mold these things together so that our standards reference grading expectations of mastery and the pedagogy in which we're gonna be providing with this Verizon Innovative Learning come together so that we can use the resources together to have students actually show mastery. As that student builds their identity as a middle school student, you start to shift that learning to a student-centered approach. And when I do that, um, that, that student has managed choice within that class of like, you know, I, I might not have to read this one book, but I might get a choice of three or four books or I might get a choice of what I get to create with that. And so having students own that is such an important task in middle school to have because as you are going down the path of equity, and I, I love that we have an equity presentation because I think this really lends itself to every kind of student owning their own learning in this environment. Uh, that it very much fuels what we're looking at from a state to what we look at in our strategic plan to what, you know, hopefully every school thinks about. Okay, thank you. Um, I just wanna say thank you. Thank you to your team, thank you to the buildings, to be able to look forward and reach out and apply for this grant. Because I can see this making a tremendous difference at our middle schools in engaging students in a different kind of way, in helping our teachers to learn to teach across curriculums. The sky's the limit with this kind of a grant because the funding is there and that funding provides the support, not just dropping computers off in the building, but, but really teaching teachers and administrators how to do this correctly. Uh, what a wonderful opportunity for our middle schools and to have all of them or almost all of them engaged in this is even better because then they have a peer group right here in Wichita Absolutely. with one another. So I, I am tremendously proud of our district and what you are doing, all of you as a team, because this can change what happens at middle schools. And I am so thankful that we were able to get it. And I'm gonna be watching it closely because I think great things. I, I wrote down here, it, we've got high expectations and we're looking as visionaries to the future because I think we're gonna change what happens in middle school driven by because of the, the funding and the, and the support that comes with this grant. So thank you very much. Ben? Yes, Ben Blankley, District One. Um, so you mentioned um, that these 78, approximately 7,800 students would, uh, and, and also the staff in the schools would receive these new devices. Yep. Um, uh, gratis from Verizon. Um, I know earlier in, in 2020, um, we achieved a one-to-one, -one, but it was a mix of devices and it was a lot of repurposed older equipment. Um, do we have a feeling on like what kind of pressure this will alleviate on our like capital improvement funding? Like not necessarily next fiscal year, but like, since we'll have this have these devices for four years, and it's a significant number of devices, mm -hmm. um, I have a feeling that it, it might, I guess that's more of a general. Yeah. Do you want me to go ahead? Um, so what I would say is, uh, uh, one, of the, one of the opportunities that we have because of COVID, um, we deployed older devices to middle school students. Uh, just because devices didn't show up, right? We bought those back in March, April timeframe and we didn't get them until October. Well, um, middle school launched start in full remote. So we deployed uh, Chromebook devices and older devices to those students. Uh, those, devi those newer devices that we did, we deployed to elementary students. And so we have an opportunity to provide a better experience for elementary students uh, through those devices and deploy these devices to middle school students uh, at those 12 schools and supply the other three schools with their one-to-one -one as well with newer devices. It, it will alleviate some of the capital programs, but you know, I, I look to this initiative. Uh, there'll be robotics that come out of this uh, program. I would say the exploratory practice in these programs will, will do far more than, than just saving us dollars. I, I think there's a, just a whole different experience that these kids are gonna have. Thank you. Julie? 
Do you mind just putting the slide up again about of the 12 schools, just so that we can celebrate yeah. with those 12 and sure. um, know where to be looking in the future? Yeah, this it's is almost exciting. easier Thank to you. say the the ones that didn't. Yeah, yeah. And the ones I mean, it's outside of <laughs> Allison, Wilbur, Stuckey, and then our three K eight. So Allison, okay. Wilbur, Stuckey, and our three K eights are not in this cohort, uh, but all the rest of our middle schools did make it. Um, and that is the only reason why those other three were not is because they're not title buildings and they don't yeah. receive significant yeah. title dollars. Otherwise, we would have put them in the pool too. And this is a this is a title initiative. So. Um, it's because of the dis difference of the economics in those schools. Yeah, that's so exciting. Thank you. Cohort one through seven was 264 schools, including cohort eight becomes 365 schools. And so uh, we have 12 of those 365. Okay, well, thank you very much. It was great to have this presentation. I, we all look forward to seeing it begin to roll and move into next school year. So thank you. Fantastic. I think they should receive an applause. I can agree to that. <laughs> this is exciting. You know, you didn't say it, Rob, but at 1.8 million, I figured that up, that's about $19 million. That's a lot of money over four years. So thanks to Verizon. Next item, Mike. Oh, you're busy. The next item under education is Department of Equity, Diversity, and Accountability presentation. This department works closely to close the achievement, opportunity, and participation gaps in the pursuit of the district's four long-term goals. Tonight's presentation highlights the history, current initiatives, and future work of the department. This presentation is for the board's information. I have been looking forward to this presentation. Thank you very much for being here. <laughs> so happy to be here. Well, this has been a long time coming. We've been trying to get this one on the agenda for a while, um, but we've just had some issues with COVID every time it was, we wanted to do it, then that became the priority. And so we kept going back and back. So we said, no way, we dug our heels in this time and said, we're going to move forward with this. And I am so excited to have Mr. Uh, Mr. Polite and uh, Mr. Reynolds here. And they have some, been doing some wonderful, amazing things in that equity and accountability office. And I just thought it was time for us to share some of those cool opportunities that are starting to happen for our children and be able to see some movement and some closing of some gaps or learning opportunities, I will say, not gaps, but learning opportunities that exist among subgroups and begin to get the ball rolling and things are rolling. And so we just want to start out by just kind of giving you an introduction to some of the things that are happening and then remembering to come back on a regular basis to continue to keep you all updated. So this is our first opportunity to explore this with you and I will turn it over to my colleagues. Good evening, Board President Logan, Vice President Hedder. Superintendent Dr. Thompson and other board members. I'm Keith Reynolds. I'm the Director of Equity and Diversity Training, and our presentation tonight will to be provide you information on the Equity, Diversity, and Accountability uh, Office within USD 259. And greetings, uh, President Logan, Pre uh, Vice President Hendrick, and Superintendent Dr. Thompson. I am William Polite, and I am the Director of the Equity, Diversity, and Accountability Department, and we'd just like to thank you for allowing us to be here tonight with such a busy agenda already. So thank you. Tonight what we'll talk to you about is uh, the history of the Equity Department. It does go back to 2000 and 2001. We'll give you details on that. We're also, we'll share information about current employees and positions that we have. We're a growing entity and it is needed, as well as the nature of our work past and present. The vision and mission that we have within that uh, office, which uh, mirrors what we have in USD 259, as well as initiatives that we have taken up in order to help our uh, most neediest students to be able to gain equity. 
and also future plans that we might have as well. There's a quote that uh, we stole from a equity and diversity expert by the name of Dr. Vernon Myers. And that quote is, diversity is being invited to the party, inclusion is being asked to dance, and equity is being asked to help plan the party. Uh, that quote is synonymous with how we uh, view our relationship with USD 259's leadership. We believe that we've been graciously invited, uh, the equity department, to this party. Uh, information and resources and consultation has been sought from us, your input, and that's in order to plan an equitable school and work environment, which we are very much vigilant at seeing take place. Our primary objective is that we want to make sure that we are useful, reliable uh, resource to leadership, to our community, to all of our students, all of our students that tend to have deficits in various areas of attendance, academics, behavior, various things, as well as assisting our staff and parents so that we draw closer to becoming one because that is our primary objective. When it comes to linking equity to the strategic plan, there are areas within the strategic plan that we hold dear within the equity department. Increasing graduation rate, we want to see that happen. Schools trusted as safe places, we believe that if our students are part of being in a belonging or inclusion, then that makes them feel safe in their school environment. We want to make sure that we have a uh, significant work at closing the uh, disproportion, disproportionality gap. And that disproportionality gap gets into achievement gaps, opportunity gaps, as well as participation gaps. Our objective is that we want all of our students to dream, believe, and achieve, and uh, to have an equitable learning environment to be able to do that. We firmly believe that that can be done, and we are diligent in seeing that that happens in a short period of time as well. On a historical basis, when this department was created in 2000 and 2001 school year, they had two to five employees. They started growing as well. Their primary focus was on offering recommendations to the board. We had busing situations at that time. They were to focus on busing equity. They were to focus on diversity training as well as uh, magnet school selection. A lot of the work circled around uh, the department assisting board in at an advising type of capacity, developing, monitoring, and implementing policies, working with busing students for desegregation, emphasizing parent and student choice, and attendance to neighborhood schools. There was a lot of focus at that time on promoting and maximizing student education achievement and equity in educational programs, offering resources and opportunities to all of our students. Our primary objective is that all of our students, regardless of those deficits, regardless of where they're from, their income, that we give them an opportunity and that equity reigns supreme. Mr. Polite. And moving into our current status as the equity department, um, we've really grown under the leadership of Dr. Thompson and Dr. Geeson and our former Deputy Superintendent Dr. Irving. We are now at uh, seven employees, and of course our focus still is on closing achievement gaps, significant disproportionality in the disciplinary area, area uh, diversity training, the magnet curriculum and instruction, uh, family and community engagement, and just improving awareness overall of the student and inclusion and belonging. As many of you know, we're part of the Males of Color Pledge that we're gonna talk about a little more here in detail. Um, currently, we're staffed by myself, the director uh, of the department, and then Keith uh, Reynolds, the director of training for equity and diversity. Um, Carla Clement, support for equity in the magnet offices. Uh, Phyllis White Cotner, uh, magnet and curriculum and instruction lead. Uh, you heard from Jesse Milney a little earlier with the Magnet School Science and Technology Facilitator, and Tamara Huff, who has now been moved over to our department from the, to look at equity, uh, family engagement through an equity lens, and she's our family and community network specialist. And then our newest hire is Carmen Altenberg, who's our Magnet Program Specialist.
In our department, we're defining educational equity as making decisions strategically based upon the principles of fairness, which include providing a variety of edu educational resources, models, programs, and strategies according to student needs that may or may not be the same for every student or school with the intention of leading to an equality of academic outcomes. Uh, the key word here is may or may not uh, in this definition. For far too often, we take proven practices in one school setting and simply believe they'll simply translate into another school and provide the same results. Uh, the passion for change we know sometimes must be local and rooted in specific school environments and nurtured in the people uh, actually doing the work on the ground there. As we move into the vision that we've adopted for the department and in collaboration with our strategic plan is that Wichita Public Schools envisions a future in which student outcomes are not predicted by student social factors or challenges. WPS is committed to ensure equitable educational opportunities for all students by demonstrating an ongoing commitment to equity across the district by allocating resources equitably while providing diverse learning opportunities. Equitable allocation of resources is the key to this work as we grow the work across the district. Dr. John Marshall out of uh, Louisville uh, made a statement to me when I was at the Council of Great City Schools. He said, if you want to see the commitment to equity in your, uh, in your uh, district, don't go to the equity department. You go to the budgeting department and see where the commitment lies. As we move into the mission for the equity department, it says WPS will provide equitable access to a high standard of educational success for all students with the intention of closing achievement gaps, particularly for student groups with the greatest academic needs. We at WPS will establish high standards for all students while providing equitable opportunities, support, and resources needed so all students receive a high quality education during the time they're enrolled in Wichita Public Schools. I have to uh, stop right there just for a quick second and say my personal story as a proud product of Wichita Public Schools. I'm actually uh, in my high school as we speak. I'm a 1984 graduate of Wichita North High School and uh, come from a challenged background, single parent home and many of the challenges that you see in many urban environments. Um, but as we talk, as we speak about all students receiving a high quality education. I can say here proudly that I received a quality education here in Wichita Public Schools. And our challenge here in the equity department is to ensure that all of our students are receiving that same high quality education that I received matriculating from K through 12 right here as a young man of color in Wichita Public Schools. And I am a proud, very proud graduate of our school district. Our roles and responsibilities, the Office of Equity, Diversity, and Accountability. We are currently designing and implementing strategies and programs to integrate diversity and equity into all aspects of the Wichita Public Schools mission and culture. We're committed to creating, building, and sustaining an environment that embraces and celebrates racial, ethnic, cultural, and social economic diversity. This is just a current snapshot of the roles and responsibilities of our office. And Mr. Reynolds is going to get into some of our priorities. As we progress through and, and assess things within the district, we develop priorities, things that we need to work on first and foremost. In creating an equity advisory council, we want it to work with our community, our community partners, our parents, to get their perspective on what the needs are. When in creating an equity champions in every school, we want it champions someone that could work with our building leaders and stakeholders when it comes to equity matters, when it comes to providing training, uh, and also to just to be able to take a pulse on, of what's going on out in our schools so that we would be able to know what areas that we were needed to assist in. In increasing equity training, we wanted to make sure that we catered to the specifics when it comes to cultural deficits in our schools. There's so many situations where unless we ask, we don't know, but there are some various needs and we want to make sure that we were able to harvest together those resources that were needed to help our students, our parents and our staff and our building leaders to be successful. Increasing support, mentoring and tutoring our students. We have students with academic and behavioral needs. 
our mentors would be trained and they would work with our building child study teams and others to make sure that our students receive equitable and a good education and that increases the chance that they would meet the strategic plan that we have spoken about that are pillars within this district. Eliminating disproportionate discipline of minority students as well as disabled students. In those cases, we want to make sure that we consulted with and teamed up with building leaders to eliminate disproportionate discipline of all students. There are certain things that we offer training and consultation to help us to understand what is the crux of those deficits because we want our students in the classroom learning instead of being expelled and not in school, particularly if it's not for reasons that are beneficial to the well-being of that student. So we are will we were wanting to work with the schools to work on those issues. Increasing inclusiveness and belonging to every student. And we wanted to make sure that we were able to help our kids to feel like they belonged in those schools. It's interesting, we will state, that's my Dillon's. It would be awesome if our students, if our parents could say, that's my school, that's my district, and I'm proud of that. And that is something that we see as a very important uh, goal to achieve. Increasing awareness and confronting unconscious bias. We have primary goals with awareness, knowledge and developing skill sets. If we have deficits, that doesn't make us bad people. Those are things that we need to confront, particularly if they become obstacles in stopping our students from achieving and being all they can be. Those things are done without having an adversarial type of approach. It's more of a working as a team, working as one to achieve those objectives. And finally, challenging stereotypes and producing a bias-free work environment. Our thoughts were to do that through assessing the environments in our schools, consulting with various individuals and stakeholders in our schools, offering training, partnering with our community as well as our stakeholders to create an action plan to help us all to win when all is said and done and in the end. Additional priorities we had were to improve recruitment and retention of our African American male teachers K through five. We were working with our human resource department willing to go out to our uh, HB uh, historically black colleges and other colleges. We want to be inclusive. Anything, everything about our department, sometimes people will mistake it for being exclusive, but we want to be very much inclusive. But we also don't want to overlook those primary deficits that are apparent and obvious. We want to work more closely be with our restorative practice groups, culturally responsive teaching groups, social and emotional learning groups and resources in USD 259, as well as those trauma-informed services, because we want to make sure that we help our teachers to connect with our students. When it comes to ensuring digital and educational equity and opportunities, Rob Dixon said it best. We want to make sure that our kids have access to techno technology, regardless of the deficits and the things that they deal with outside of the school area. Ongoing inclusiveness, belonging, and equity assessments of stakeholders, that allows us to take a pulse on what's going on in our schools, allows us to find out what the needs are and be able to work with our schools and those within the schools and the community to be able to fulfill those needs. And finally, to increase the number of African-American males in advanced educational programs. There is a deficit there. We believe that we can work with our students in order to have a higher number presented in our advanced educational programs. And the reason that we focus on that is not because of race, it's because we want to make sure that opportunities are available for all of those, particularly those that may have been overlooked that should be in those classrooms. Mr. Polite. And <clears throat> this is our work, our ALT, our Academic Learning Team Work Group, which was newly formed uh, this year as part of the ALT process. And um, so we're just very happy because this is where the real work will be done to spread the equity work throughout the district. This is our number one goal this year was our wildly important goal or wig for the department was to decrease the suspension of our African American students by 10% annu annually from presently at 37% down to 17% by 2023. 
Um, the equity work group, as I mentioned, is the newest work group in the ALT department. And we currently have 29 members in the work group that includes representation from all levels. Um, we held our first meeting December 21st and then our second meeting actually this morning. And so uh, very excited about our team members and the expertise and experience that we have as a part of the equity work group, uh, ALT work group. These are the three task force. All the work groups have task force. And these are the first three, I should say, task force that we have put together. Um, the first one being the training uh, for the Equity Learning Academy, which we're gonna talk a little bit more about more. And then the Males of Color Pledge, which is some of you are familiar with. We'll talk a little bit more about that. And um, the Family Engagement Task Force as well. This first task force, as mentioned, is the Equity Learning Academy, which, of course, Mr. Reynolds there will be a major part of leading there, with, along with some of our other champions within the district as well. Um, but this task force is, will establish what we call an Equity Learning Academy, which will have an equity champion from each school. And then the equity champion will assist the principal or AP in establishing an equity committee for the school. And Keith is gonna talk a little bit more about the actual trainings that we currently offer and will be offering in the future here. The trainings that you have, that, you, uh, that are up on the slide, they're just a few of quite a bit, quite of many. Uh, these are menus of trainings that are in place at this time and that have been there for a while and um, we, that will be used not only to train our leadership, which we've done quite often. Matter of fact, we did quite a bit of training for our leadership last week and we're doing it this week as well, but also to staff, to community and to our students. We have primary objectives with our training. We want to make sure that people are as culturally aware as possible without feeling bad. There is, it is possible to train people in cultural proficiency without them leaving their feeling bad about who they are. And, and that is huge with us to make sure we accomplish that. We want to make sure that knowledge is gained. If you leave there knowing something that you didn't know before, then we've been successful. And also to provide a skill set, not only to our leaders, but our staff and students. We want them to be culturally proficient and we believe that that could be done in an environment to where people don't leave feeling offended. And so that is our primary approach when it comes to training. And our next task force is uh, the Males of Color Pledge and our SIG Dis Task Force as we look at the significant disproportionality. As most of you know, we are a member of the Council of Great City Schools, which is approximately 70 of the largest urban school districts uh, in the United States. And we, uh, they came up with the male, they established the Males of Color Pledge in 2013 um, as a response to the national data surrounding males of color and, and or African American and Hispanic males specifically. Uh, you have a copy of the pledge uh, with you, as well as the key performance indicators that are utilized to measure the uh, progress or lack thereof. You should have a handout there. But these are a few of just the highlights of the Males of Color pledge that we will adapt and adopt and implement elementary and middle school efforts to increase the pipeline of males of color who are succeeding academically and socially in our urban schools and who are on track to succeed in high school reducing absenteeism, reducing the disproportionate suspensions, and developing initiatives and regular report on progress and increasing the number of males of color and other students participating in advanced placement and honors courses in gifted and talented programs, as Keith has already mentioned there on an earlier slide. And that we will overall we begin to engage in a broader discussion and examination of how issues of race, language, and culture affect the work of our district. That's all a part of the National Council of Great Cities Schools Pledge um, that we are signed on to and a part of now. Um, some other parts, other goals of the pledge there, once again, is revising suspension and discipline policies, practices, and procedures. And we know how those can contribute to the next bullet there, that what we call that school to prison pipeline. And so in using this restorative practices there as well and other targeted interventions district-wide and we are providing, uh, establishing now what we call the Future Ready Mentoring Program for, to support these young men throughout their matriculation through uh, Wichita Public Schools. You know, this work is very personal uh, 
for us as well, as I mentioned, being a graduate. We're both former Wichita Public Schools graduates and males of color. Uh, we both grew up in two of the poorest zip codes in Wichita, Kansas. Uh, but because of the power of education that we received in Wichita Public Schools, we stand before you now because of what was poured into us by our WPS teachers, our families, and our community. So this work is very, very important to us all. And as we look at the, our, our third um, task force, uh, is looking at family engagement through an equity lens. And so we're so happy that we have our family and community specialists now in our department to really begin to look at how do we strengthen those relationships between the schools, families, and the community to support student success and developing targeted programs that engage and support families and students. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about that first initiative there in a little bit. But these are some of the initiatives that we already have in place. Some of you have been a part of those. Some of you have come out and spoken at some of our events that we've had. And the first one there is the 9503 campaign, and that just stands for uh, our, around all of the programs that we're trying to put in place within the equity department is, is aligning them with those three simple measurable goals, a 95% attendance rate, a zero uh, in school or out of school suspensions, and a 3.0 or higher GPA, which are district goals overall. And we just came up with that, so let's call it 9503, and begin a camp, somewhat of a campaign uh, through all of the work that we're doing. Um, we, we, we're gonna talk a little bit more about that as we go forward here. And just for sake of time, we're gonna move on to the BASE program, which stands for Better Academics and Social Excellence. And this is our motto where it's cool to be smart. And this has become one of our signature programs in the equity department. Now, we started uh, three years ago uh, when our first group of young men were seventh and eighth graders. Uh, President Logan, I think you spoke at the first kickoff event out at AMAC, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. And welcomed all of our young men where we had nearly 500 young men there that earned a 3.2 GPA, um, had minimal office referrals or suspensions, and a 90, 90 plus uh, percent uh, attendance rate. And they all are now, that group is now um, ninth and 10th graders. So that first group that you met with there are now ninth and 10th graders. And we're so excited about the work that's happening there with the base program as we try to change that narrative around some of our young men of color. Um, we have to just continue to celebrate these guys on a regular basis if we wanna see more of these young men be attracted to groups like base, where the motto once again is that it's cool to be smart. And I'm very thankful for all the support that this board and Dr. Thompson has given us as we've tried to grow this program throughout the district to attract more young men uh, to programs like this. Uh, but you can see just our goals there, closing AP honors and participation gaps, building a positive peer group uh, for our students. We now have chapters in all of our 18 of our middle schools and now all of our high schools as well have base uh, uh, chapters. Um, on our next slide here, we've established some great partnerships with our local universities. Uh, one of the biggest partnerships has been with Wichita State uh, University, uh, where 147 of our young men uh, were greeted by deans of colleges last year, and each of them received Wichita State college IDs, where now they all have access to the Heskett Center, the library, uh, the, uh, uh, the Student Radigan Center, and as well as any other amenities that other college students have there. We had a very successful kickoff uh, this fall as we, some of our kids participated in the base learning lounge there as part of our My School Remote Learning. We had about 34 young men who spent the first nine weeks on campus uh, this year being college students. Friends has hosted us in a number of events, including our first end of the year, um, our first end of the year uh, celebration in our first year of existence. So those partnerships are really growing there. And uh, this is one of our, our signature programs as well, the Middle School Junior League Football Challenge, with the goal just being uh, to, to increase the college scholarship opportunities for our Junior League football players in the Wichita Public School District by creating system structures and spaces that'll guarantee success for this subgroup of student athletes. And they also meet regularly at their schools in groups like you see there on the screen with different speakers and 
uh, community members and their, and their um, principals and, and others to encourage them not to just play football, but to try to achieve that 9503 initiative. And on our next slide there, the Books Over Balls program is a program we started two years ago uh, where we meet at Chester Lewis with these young men that are now in high school and helping them to uh, continue to be successful student athletes. And we have a number of them now who are now in college and, certain, and some currently being recruited by colleges as well. Uh, that group meets at Chester Lewis Center every Monday and Wednesday at 530. Um, the next program here is our Engaging Congregations program where we had 50 of our pastors and youth pastors joined us uh, last spring right before the pandemic hit to really discuss how the engaging, how, how our African American congregations could become more engaged in the work of the district and helping us to reach that 9503 in their own specific congregations. Uh, the next one there is a Bulldog Summer Bridge program, which many of you are familiar with, we, we had for two years. We couldn't do it this past summer, but we had over 100 students participated and the average participation rate of 63 students a day with a focus on algebra skills. And we met for five weeks right before the school year started, two days per week, partnering with Tabernacle Bible Church and the Wichita Bulldogs. It was a very successful um, event there. You can see our esteemed Dr. Thompson back there participating in teaching class on the picture there uh, as well. And then Prime Fit Mentoring is a program that you all have helped to support to bring into the schools that are now mentoring our young men at six of our elementary schools, Buckner, Clark, Gordon Park, Cleover, Mueller, and Spate, um, with approximately 120, 120 students served in the mentoring program, uh, approximately 20 hours a week in each school. And that's just another slide as we've already talked quite a bit about family engagement. And I will go on there to our next slide, which is uh, just other initiatives that are in the district. But what we want to highlight there is the fact that we now have a web page for the equity department. And please take a moment to go on to the web page, which is listed in our departments there. Um, Keith and, and Jesse have been doing a great job of building that web page. Keith, you want to say anything about that? And the, the, one of the things that we find that's very good about that web page is it has lesson plans for our teachers and things for our students if they want to delve into things on a cultural basis. I mean, so it's their choice, but there's a plethora of things available for them to get into and the learning experiences that they can expand their horizons if they so choose to. And so we want to put out quite a bit of a buffet of uh, educational opportunities for them if they wanted to expand their, their minds and to learn new things that are outside of their usual arena or scope of, of focus or learning. And so in this case, we encourage them to go out, peruse through and look into things, hopefully learn something and share that, but we're going to expand and work more with our schools and our, uh, particularly through our equity work group to find out what more we can do in order to have a lot of things more accessible to our, our stakeholders. We're having videos that are available for training that are 15 minutes or less that cut out the fat and get right to the point of unconscious bias and various other things. And so all of that, that website holds all of those things and it is readily available for anyone that teachers, community, students, mm -hmm. there's something for all of them if they want to look into it and see if there's something that piques their interest. And for sake of time, we won't go into all the other initiatives there, but those are just some of the other ones that, that are listed and feel free to contact us with any questions and, and or questions that you might questions. have. Okay, Ernestine. beautiful. This is a little overwhelming. It's so <laughs> expansive and so wonderful. Um, I assume that the seven of you can't do all of this by yourselves. That's a great question. <laughs> um, could you talk about how volunteers are involved, how paid staff, how, how you might hire people to be involved? Who, who do you encourage then that does all of this? Because this is just amazing, but I know you can't do all of it. Well, thank you, and you're very correct. <laughs> <laughs> but we, we have had great community support in a number of our programs that we've been putting together. Uh, but like, as I mentioned, Dr. Thompson and Dr. Giesen have been really supporting the growth of the, of the department as well. Um, we're going to be looking to look 
at some future staffing with as far as the mentors that we talked about in the Future Ready Advocate Program. Uh, but some of the real work that's beginning to take place is the equity work group that we talked about and those different task force, which will also have focus groups to really spread the work, I'm sorry, to really spread the work uh, within the district and grow the work within the district. It is, it is a big task. When you start talking about syst systematic change in, in, in the world of equity, but uh, I think together, all of us, we can do it though, yes. Well, programs like BASE and things like that, now are those people that work with those children, are they volunteers, are they no, paid, each? or are they you? <laughs> <What>? <laughs> it used to just be me, but no, not anymore. Uh, we have what we call site coordinators at every school that receive a small stipend to meet with the boys bi-weekly to schedule speakers and different events and field trips. So no, we do have a site coordinator at every school and now at every, at every high school as well that's worked with the boys individually, I mean, at, at their respective schools, I should say. There's also, uh, we're, we're expanding our, our horizon into the community. Working with the police department, they've wanted to come in and, and officers want to work with our kids. Cargill has offered to come in and work with our kids. Wichita Art Museum employees have offered to come in and work with our kids. And so we're collaborating with them as well as trying to organize ways to make that possible. So you'd be surprised at how many entities in the community show interest. And we try to talk to them on a, on a frequent basis to see what resources they have and they're willing to share, but to also partner with them. If they have that heartfelt drive to want to work with our kids, we're not going to be an obstacle to having them to achieve that objective. And I must mention, Ernestine, the Real Men, Real Heroes, who's been working very closely with us, uh, different sororities and fraternities uh, throughout the city as well, volunteering countless hours in coming in and working with our young men and women at, at a number of our schools. And that's, don't for, that's not forget our churches. That's right. They have yes. been very instrumental. Yes, without a doubt. And that's the engaging congregations. Thank you, Dr. Thompson. They, our, our church, our faith-based community is really becoming engaged in the work as well. Like I said, we had a great kickoff, two kickoff sessions right before the pandemic hit. And of course, church and everything else got shut down. Uh, but looking forward to re-engaging with our faith-based community uh, in this work as well. Well, one last question. If there's somebody out there, particularly, say, a man of color, that says, oh, that sounds exciting. I would love to be involved. Can they call you? Yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Please, yes. So understand. like for t tutoring and mentoring that we're talking about on these programs, yes. you are open to people calling you up and volunteering to be a part of this program. Yes, completely open. <laughs> Teamwork <laughs> makes the dream work. <laughs> Thank you. And Ernestine also, let, let us clarify, they don't have to be a male of color. That's right. We, we want to be inclusive. Everyone has something to contribute. And if they're willing to work with our kids, we're going to take them. Bless you. Thank you. <laughs> Julie? This is incredible. Thank you for this presentation. Very thorough, and I agree with Ernestine. You guys got so many things that you're doing, it's almost overwhelming, but uh, fabulous, and I'm, I'm confident you'll make some progress. Um, on my page six, I think it's probably your slide 12, um, I wanna ask Mr. Reynolds a specific question. Um, Mr. Reynolds, you and I worked years ago on this, uh, the task of um, improving diversity in our hiring. Mm -hmm. And I know several of the board members here have been very interested in this uh, bullet point of improving recruitment and retention of African American male teachers. And you have specifically here K through five, but uh, you know, I think that also can include all grade levels. Do you have any data available or do you even just kind of know off the top of your head? Have we made progress in that area? I know we found it, you know, five years ago, we, we had it as a great goal and it was very important to us, but it was, it was difficult to achieve um, because we didn't find those that were interested in the position. So um, could you just let me know how that's, is that going any better? Um, the, re the recruitment part, it, 
recruitment and retention is hand in hand. It's one thing to, to grab a great candidate, and there are great candidates out there. And we're going through programs like Grow Your Own Teacher and various other things that HR is doing an excellent job. Those statistics, I'd have to work with HR to get those statistics. But we're doing a great job of, of getting the attention of that population. The key is the retention. And so the emphasis is there as well. But we are working with HR right now, and I'll be glad to get, talk with them to get to you the statistics. But we're working with them right now and making plans on recruiting trips and various other things. And part of that equity work group will also assist us with ways and avenues in order to help us with recruitment and, and retention, because they are a, a, an, advis an, an advisory type of entity, and we've got a great group of people that are within that work group. But I'll be glad to get you those statistics, but retention is the key. It, it almost defeats the purpose, almost, to grab these great candidates and we lose them quickly. Yeah. But I'll be glad to give you that information, Jill. And I'm going to also stay on this recruitment piece because we actually are starting our recruitment in the high schools and eventually we're moving down to the middle schools. I understand there's some work happening there. So what we're trying to do there is to attract those students into teaching as we speak. It's interesting that we have this particular pilot that I can see some real progress being made where you graduate from high school. If there are pair of professional positions that are opening, those students are being hired in those positions working, and then they are actually going to Wichita State uh, to do some work in the evenings for their degrees, and then they're utilizing those hours of on the job as classes too, and then they graduate and then we hire them. Oh, so fabulous. when you start yeah. thinking about a pipeline of leaders and teacher leaders that we're trying to, to, to uh, you know, get to come and, and get into the profession, um, we are starting very, very early because that's what it's gonna take in order to be able to uh, recruit, not just, you know, teaching is becoming a, a profession that a lot of people struggle to want to become a part of for whatever reasons. So we've got to really do a good job, as he said, is toot our own horns as being an educator is a, is a great thing. But then on the other hand, we need to make sure that they get uh, the attention and get it early in their minds that this is a cool profession and get them experiences and those kinds of things. And that's what we're hoping to be able to do also. And you can recruit minorities uh, of people, people of color. We really want some males is what we're looking for. Uh, so we're really hunting to see if we can find some uh, men. I don't care what color, like you said, we don't really care. We're inclusive. Anybody of a male uh, descent that wants to become a teacher, we want to encourage that and foster that and water it and then have them stay with us as we move forward. So that's really the long-term plan. And we've already started some of that work and we'll continue. Ah, that's fantastic. And, Thank and, you very much. And Dr. Thompson, can I just add to that just a, a quick snippet that we are working directly with Wichita State. Hi. And they are developing a program called Males of Color Future Educators. And so we've been working directly with them to begin that pipeline work that Dr. Thompson is talking about and to, to begin to attract these young men into our Educators Rising program as we speak. So you're going to hear a lot more about that with Dr. Ashley Jack and Dr. Kim McDowell up at Wichita State. That's and excellent. Thank not you just for your young, young men, but young ladies as well. Mm -hmm. We want to make sure that we are not exclusive. But even with the base program, those are, you're talking about a large pool of young men that have good grade point average, no behavioral issues, great attendance. That pool we also have tapped into to try to push them into the educational area. And with Wichita State and Friends also, Diana had that population within their educational departments or in their educational degree areas. Our partnership with them is, is growing stronger, and that is becoming a fruitful pipeline. pipeline. Ben? Yes, Ben Blankley, District 1. Um, thank you, gentlemen, for being here. This is, uh, this is exciting. Um, you know, as Dr. Tom said, a long time coming. Um, this is, I think, one of, the, one of the presentations that I had asked for. Um, so I'm really excited to, to see it. Um, right? Yeah. Um, so, because, uh, like, so anecdotally, I think, I can't remember where I read it, but um, I read once that it said that nationwide, our urban schools are sometimes more segregated now than they were 
right before Brown versus Board of Education. Um, and then, of course, now we have this um, other socioeconomic piece of problems with equity um, that we have to work to, uh, to work to close. Um, and so I'm, I'm excited. Uh, it's important, very hard work. Um, and, and like you said, it's not, it's not siloed. There's, there's pieces of it in, in all the work that, that our district does. Um, and so I, I think this is great. Um, I think we're probably going to see a multiplier effect um, on, the, on, on the, the general student population achievement. Um, as certain segments grow, I think all our students are going are gonna to see that. So thank you. That is the goal. Thank you, sir. Okay. Thank you very much. We really appreciate your presentation tonight, gentlemen. And, and it's wonderful to see this being developed in depth, which is what you've done. So thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Next item, Mike. Consent. Um, let's start with Mike Rohde. Do you have anything to pull from consent? No, I don't. Uh, Ron, do you have anything to pull from consent? Ron? We'll come back to Ron. He's probably trying to get it off of mute still. Uh, Ernestine, do you, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Ron. Yeah, I'm having some technical difficulties. No, I do not have anything to pull. Okay, thank you very much. Ernestine? Yep. Ernestine, I do not have anything to pull. Julie? Yes, uh, Julie Hedrick, District 2. I would like to pull A2. A2, okay. Uh, I have nothing to pull. Stan? Stan Research District 4, no consent items to pull. Ben? Um, ben Blankley, District 1, no consent items to pull. Okay. Uh, do I have a motion to accept the rest of the consent agenda except for A2? Ben Blankley. that we accept the consent agenda except for A2. Ben Blankley, District 1, I second. Okay. Uh, Ernestine Crable motioned and Ben Blankley, Blankley seconded. Uh, that we accept the consent agenda. Uh, we will need to vote by voice vote since we have two absent members tonight, starting with Ben. Ben Blankley, District 1, yes. Stan Reeser, District 4, yes. Cheryl Logan, at large, yes. Julie Hedrick, District 2, yes. Ernestine Crable, District 3, yes. Mike? Mike Rohde, District 5, yes. Ron? Ron Rosales, District 6, yes. The consent agenda passes except for A2. And Julie, you pulled that one. Would you like to? Yes, um, A2 is the item uh, regarding the employment agreement with Service Union Employees International Union, Local 513, Uniform Security offers, Officers and Security Dispatchers. And um, I am very much in favor of this and will make a motion to approve it. I just wanted to, to highlight it and thank those um, security officers and security dispatchers that uh, worked with this. And I'm pleased that now with uh, this agreement being approved tonight, we'll have taken care of all of our employee groups and uh, we'll have uh, contract signed and can move forward with um, getting uh, the proper pay to uh, folks and uh, and moving forward with all of our employees taken care of. So um, thank you to those involved and I would like to um, make a motion to approve um, consent item A2. I second it. Okay, the motion was made by Julie Hedrick and seconded by Ernestine Crable. Would you please cast your vote, starting with Ernestine? Yes. Ernestine Crable, yes. Julie Hedrick, District 2, yes. Cheryl Logan at large, yes. Stan Reeser, District 4, yes. Ben Blankley, District 1, yes. Mike? Mike Rohde, District 5, yes. Ron? Ron Rosales, District 6, yes. Okay. Uh, motion passes 7-0. Next item.
Under policy, first review, new BOE policy 0400, non-discrimination statement, and cross-references in seven other policies. This agenda item provides a measure to amend the Wichita Public Schools Statement of Non-Discrimination, codify the Statement of Non-Discrimination in new BOE Policy 0400, and cross-reference Policy 0400 with seven other BOE policies. Language is included in new BOE Policy 0400 to prohibit discrimination on the basis of genetic information. Language is also included in other existing policies to more clearly identify behavior that will be considered harassment or discrimination on the basis of sex. This will ensure that the language is consistent with several recent decisions of the United States Supreme Court, including Bostock versus Clayton County. The Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act of 2008, or GINA, is a federal law that prohibits employers from basing employment decisions on information about an individual's genetic tests, tests given a family member, family medical history, request for or receipt of genetic services, and or genetic information about a fetus or embryo. GINA also prohibits harassment on the basis of genetic information. For more information, see the U.S. Equal Employment Opportunity Commission's fact sheet Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act in the appendix of this BOE meeting. In the three cases often cited together as Bostock versus Clayton County, the United States Supreme Court ruled that discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation or gender identity are forms of discrimination, quote, because of sex, unquote, as prohibited by Title VII. The district's statement of non-discrimination already prohibits discrimination on these bases. However, a number of other policies which address or refer to harassment and or discrimination require amendment to ensure consistency with the statement of non-discrimination and the law as articulated in Boston and in the interest of ensuring a safe, supportive environment for district students, parents, teachers, administrators, classified staff and others. The policies are 0400 non-discrimination statement new policy. The new policy is cross-referenced in the seven policies that follow and controls all BOE policies and other district doc documents. 0900 integration and diversity. 0910 civil rights resolution. 1115 sexual harassment of employees. 1116, sexual harassment of students. 1119, harassment of students. 1120, harassment of employees. 4025, equal opportunity employer. This item provides an opportunity for the board's first review of the proposed new BOE policy 0400 non-discrimination statement, as well as cross-referencing in seven other identified policies. Okay, what seems like a long time ago now, we uh, voted on our uh, statement uh, for discrimination. Since then, just to non kind of, non-discrimination, <laughs> sorry, non-discrimination. Uh, since then, there have been court cases that have come in. So what we're doing is we're taking our statement and moving it to policy to include the information that was in the court cases. So there will be two reads on this policy and also on the other policies that are listed there because those are all being brought up to date to match to our anti-discrimination policy piece. So that's kind of in a summary what this is. Are there questions uh, on the uh, policy 400, which is the non-discrimination statement? Um, ben? I'm, I'm just excited that we were ahead of the ahead of the courts on this one um it's just it's it shows that we were we made the right decision mm -hmm. yes because everything we did matched right to what the court said mm -hmm. okay ron or or uh, mike do you have any questions on this it will go for a second well, read. no okay all right all right, I think that we then automatically move 
this into a second read for our next meeting and uh, we're ready for the next item. Thanks, Mike. I had a, I had a question, Sharon. Oh, I'm sorry, Julie. Um, I agree with Ben. I'm excited that this is here and I did have an opportunity to read through all of the policies and uh, so far it, they, they, seem, they seem good to me that they're consistent with uh, what we wanna do. Um, I just have a, a specific question for Superintendent Thompson. Um, I remember when we talked about this months ago, it seems like forever ago now, but I remember one of the specific um, items of concern that was brought up that you were gonna have your team work on was there was uh, some sort of a, a software glitch that uh, that then that caused uh, preferred names not to be included in class lists, so that then when substitutes came and such, they didn't have the proper names to identify students with. And I, I you know, at that time we knew that was going to be kind of a large, difficult project. But I just like an update on whether we've been able to take care of that and uh, just where where that is at. Yep. Yes, and I will have my colleague uh, come and share. Good evening again. Uh, Rob Dixon, Chief Information Officer. Uh, when you look at preferred name, how we introduced it this last year into online enrollment, it allowed um, the parents to change preferred name that now goes through an approval process that's then accepted by the office. We had many times uh, there were uh, just miscues in that field for preferred name because people just didn't know what it meant. Mm -hmm. So they would just put sometimes random text objects inside of there. So we've gone through that process now that the office validates that uh, term uh, before it's then entered into the system. So, so yeah. Good, thank you. <laughs> yes, good. Okay, next item, Mike. Under operations, <coughs> election of officers, Board of Education. In accordance with BOE policy 0100, organization of the board, at the board's first meeting on or after September, excuse me, the second Monday in January of each year, the board shall elect a president and vice president from its members, each of whom shall serve for one year or until their successor is elected. The election of officers shall be by open ballot. Board policy stipulates that each member may vote for any member of the board and successive ballots shall be taken for each office until one member receives four votes. The newly elected president and vice president shall assume their duties at the conclusion of the meeting at which they are elected. In the COVID-19 meeting format, if a board member participates via the conference bridge, the board member will be asked to report their vote over the conference bridge after other board members' printed ballots are collected and before those printed ballots are counted. Then all votes for that ballot will be recorded on paper and read aloud into the meeting record. Our first vote is for election of president. Okay. So we are receiving uh, just Mike and Ron. Uh, we're all being given ballots that we'll be voting uh, independently and then we will ask you each to vote orally and then our votes will be read. Uh, while that's being passed out, Julie, you, do ha you had a question. Um, yes, I, d I just wanted to um, tell my other fellow board members that um, a year ago when I was elected by you all as vice president, I had um, hoped, fully hoped that I would have your support this year, um, possibly as uh, president of the board. Um, but however, um, tonight I'm going to um, remove my name, request to remove my name for consideration for an officer. Um, COVID changed lots of things. <laughs> and uh, due to COVID, because of personal health concerns and per personal family concerns, I've had to attend quite a few meetings remotely. 
and um, um, our, our, our beloved president, uh, Ms. Logan, has uh, been here almost every meeting, and um, in my opinion, I think that's important as president to be physically present at the meeting. And, um, and I don't expect that at every meeting uh, this year will I be able to be present. Also, I, I think it's until this COVID thing is over, I think it's possible that I'll have to attend some meetings remotely. Uh, so, I, so I would like to remove my name consider, from consideration. But I do hope again in the future to serve as an officer and um, I hope that uh, when we no longer have the virus, I will be able to commit to attending all meetings in person again, like I did prior to the virus. So um, that, that's, the, that's my statement. Um, Thank so. you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And if each of you could, could uh, vote, please, uh, for the president, and then set your ballots out so that they can be picked up. Those ballots have been collected and are with uh, the clerk of the board. So, Mike, would you please vote for your choice for president? Mike Rohde, District 5. I vote for Stan Reeser. Thank you. And Ron Rosales, would you please cast your vote? Ron? Ron Rosales, District 6. Stan Reeser. Okay. is when we need to have music. <laughs> <laughs> it would be like my kid who has been singing Jingle Bells every day. <laughs> well, that's a nice happy song, even if it's the wrong season, it right? It is, it is. <laughs> the, the Board of Education has elected Stan Reeser as the board president for the 2021 calendar year. And the votes are as, as follows. Voting for Stan Reeser are Ben Blankley, Cheryl Logan, Stan Reeser, Mike Rohde, and Ron Rosales. Voting for Cheryl Logan are Julie Hedrick and Ernestine Crable. We're now ready to vote for vice president, please. Congratulations, Stan. Thank you. We will follow the same procedure this time. Okay, we do have, no, we don't. They haven't picked them up yet.
Okay, the ballots have been picked up. Um, Ron, why don't you start with the vote for the vice president? Ron Rosales. Ron Rosales, District 6, Dan Blankley. Mike. Mike Rody, excuse me, Mike Rody, District 5. My vote for Vice President is Ben Blankley. Okay, thank you. They're tallying the other votes. Yes. You might ask Ron if he's watching this online or on TV because there's about a five second delay and that may be causing his problem. Oh, okay. I don't know. Are you watching it on okay, TV? Okay, I'll check that. Thank you. Okay. Blankley as vice president for the 2001 calendar year, and that vote is 6 1. Voting for Ben Blankley are Ben Blankley, Julie Hedrick, Cheryl Logan, Stan Reeser, Mike Rohde, and Ron Rosales. Voting for Cheryl Logan are Ernestine Crable. All right, so Ben, you have been elected vice president. Congratulations. <laughs> we have a good slate of officers. Stan? Stan, Research District 4. I just want to say uh, thanks for your support, and I'll do the very best I can. But I, I just wanted to take this time real quick to thank Cheryl Logan for the year that she put in this year. <laughs> I, I think if anybody ever wrote down the history of, uh, of the BOE, maybe... If you look back, maybe the year Wichita schools uh, integrated, maybe, I don't know. I'm not enough of a historian on our particular institution. But I think this year, um, w the effort you made this year, Cheryl, was outstanding, and we really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next item, Mike. Continuing under operations. Continuing discussion of 2021 school year. At the special BOE meeting on November 30th, 2020, the board received an update on effects of the COVID-19 pandemic in Sedgwick County and the school district. Subsequently, the board approved a motion that the Wichita Public Schools transition to remote learning at all grade levels effective December 2nd, 2020, with targeted exceptions as recommended by the Sedgwick County Medical Office. As part of this motion, Special Education Individualized Education Program, or IEP services, continued as directed by a student's IEP team, as well as direct service at high schools for dual and concurrent credit and specialized labs based on academic requirements. The board approved the district to remain in full remote learning until further notice with learning model status being evaluated at tonight's BOE meeting. In addition, the district extended for one day through December 2nd, the timeline for parents to choose the preferred learning model for their students on site or remote for the second semester. The board's decision did not change the learning model for elementary students currently enrolled in my school remote, middle and high school students who continued in full remote, and students enrolled in Education Imagine Academy, which is a full remote program. Tonight's agenda item provides an opportunity for the board's discussion and or appropriate action. Thank you. And I, I just wanna make a clarifying statement before we get started on the presentation, Dr. Thompson. And that is <clears throat> the board is making the final decision tonight. No decisions have been made prior to tonight's meeting. Information has gone out because 
the, there is a recommendation from our superintendent that she has made for us, and we will be discussing that tonight. But what happens in our buildings is determined tonight. No final decisions have been made before tonight. With that, Dr. Thompson. I'm kind of glad you said that. Uh, we just had a awful time trying to prepare for on, you know, whether you vote yes or whether you vote no. So we have letters and we have the mic is on a lot. It has been a rough time <laughs> trying to plan for uh, whether or not we're going to have come back or not come back. So we've made preparation for you all for either decision. So we have communications and everything for coming back as well as staying put. So I just want uh, to the staff to know that they have worked really hard trying to create two models or bring back two ways of however way we can get back to school. So I do appreciate uh, uh, you have put a lot of work on us, but we are looking forward to being able to share what we have and hopefully uh, you all can make a decision and, uh, and give us some guidance on whether we're coming back or whether we're not. But either way, we're ready to go. With that being said, I'll turn it over to my colleague, uh, Terry, to talk about uh, what we discussed with our um, team. We, as you know, the district put together a COVID advisory team to advise the district on uh, matters of COVID. And we have, we spent a pretty good chunk of time talking about a lot of things. And we will talk about some of those things and what I can tell you from the conversations that, you know, there is really, you know, you have people in one camp that like one thing and people in another camp that like different things. So I know the decision is gonna be difficult because there are so many people that want so many different things and we're not gonna please everybody with the decision that you all make. Uh, but we'll, again, we'll be prepared to do whatever it is that you uh, ask of us at this point. So with that, I will turn it over to my colleague, Ms. Terry Moses. Good evening, President Logan, President-elect Reeser, Superintendent Thompson, uh, myself and Kimber Kazitz are here tonight to just give you some information, as Dr. Thompson said, in regards to the status of COVID. I reiterate what everybody has said and what we've said um, really since July. We knew that this was going to be an ever-changing moving target and we knew that the decisions facing you would be incredibly difficult. And as Dr. Thompson said, we knew that we would have differing opinions in regards what is the best for our children, what is the best for the staff, what is the best for our community. Uh, this is not an easy answer. We're here to just give you some information this evening. So jumping right to that information, your gating criteria. Uh, this is the current hot off the presses Sedgwick County Health Department business recovery and reopening data model. Uh, the first line is of course the student absenteeism, to absenteeism as compared to the last school year. When people glance at this, one of the feedback we've gotten is that, well, your absenteeism is above 3%. It is as compared to last year. That is what the gating criteria is. And our next slide is gonna give you a little more in depth in regards to absenteeism. Uh, the next gating criteria is a two week county percent positive case rate. And we've given you two pieces of data here. The bold number 11.29 is where the county stands currently with that two week percent positive case rate and that asterisk, asterisk with the red information is what was there November 30th when you made the decision to go fully remote. So as you can see, there's been a significant change in regards to that number. That third column, or the third row, I'm sorry, is the two-week cumulative county indency rate. Uh, although it still remains in red, you can also see there's been a significant change. Uh, the red number, the 1137.9, is what was available to you November 30th, and today it stands at 590, or the most recent data that we have is 594.6. That puts the county in a condition as stable. Uh, when you met in November 30th, that was an increasing point of data. Attendance. Uh, we ask, we get this questions asked a lot. 
when we met with the community committee uh, a week ago, one question we got was, is there consistency in regards to how people report attendance? Uh, we have talked to our administrators, Gil Alvarez, Michelle Ingenthron, uh, Vince Evans, all from uh, the educational side, and they assure us that the information provided to teachers in terms of how they count attendance is the same. Again, our interpretation is always out there, but the request that we make to our teachers in terms of how they account attendance is the same. Uh, as you can see, the areas are mainly in green, and, and that means that they're all 3% less than last year. The area where you see the red numbers are other schools, and that is our little and our pre-K. Uh, and those are the very, very young kids where we see that higher indices, and also that's a very, very, very small percentage of our total enrollment, uh, those couple of schools. Moving on, our staff data, and this was the one that you looked closely at uh, when you made the decision to go fully remote in November. That number was 334 on November 27th. That's the positive COVID-19 cases that we had among staff. That currently stands at 231. One of the things that we did over the holiday break and we have done since we've returned is we've really emphasized the need for our staff to report to let us know what their status is when you're fully remote. It's sometimes easy to lose contact, so we've really reached out to our staff and told, us, told them to make sure they let us know what their status is. The next line, staff under quarantine, uh, is currently at 8.2% or 602 active quarantines. In November, that was at 16%. And the big number in November that caused us the greatest number amount of concern, or at least from my point of view, was that we had 22 in the parentheses in red schools that had 20% of more of their staff that was quarantined. We st currently stand at three, and we currently stand at having one school that has 15 to 19% of their staff quarantined. Now, the exciting new news uh, is the advances that have come about in regards to testing and the fact that our school has taken the opportunity to partner with several agencies in regards to testing and that is giving us even more data that, and the ability for our staff to have current information around their status in regards to COVID-19. So I'll turn it over to Kimber. She can give me the hide sign whenever she wants me to update the slide. Good evening, my name is Kimber Kazitz and I'm the Director of Health Services for Wichita Public Schools. And I wanna thank Dr. Thompson, President Logan, um, the newly elected Stan Reeser President and the board for um, allowing me to speak tonight. Um, we've been working really hard um, to try to keep everyone healthy and safe and also start the contact tracing process with this testing that we have. And uh, we started with the rapid antigen testing for symptomatic individuals. This was a pilot program with KDHE. When we started, there were only 12 schools involved in this program. And now there are over 30 schools that are getting involved. However, um, there are not any schools or school districts that are at the level of testing that we are. And uh, so we have really been working to collaborate with smaller school districts and um, share information so that they can get that up and running as well. And even some of our surrounding districts, um, I've given some test kits to them because we had extra from KDHE and they didn't have theirs. So we're really trying to be collaborative community partners with other districts as well. Um, and then the saliva PCR testing for asymptomatic individuals. This is our partnership with WSU's Molecular Diagnostic Lab. I cannot say enough positive things about what they are doing to get results back to us quickly. And this weekend, we had something amazing happen that I'm gonna talk about a little later, but they're really trying to make sure that they're being customer oriented working with us. So we're blessed to have these two partners that we're working with. So we'll go ahead and move forward and just talk a little bit about rapid antigen testing. This testing began initially in November. 
Okay, we started mid-November. This is before Thanksgiving. And um, we just did our staff members. And um, then in December, we expanded it to family members, okay? And so we, we also included students and we opened it up for their family members. And we opened it up to first student and their family members. I mean, that's an impact. We have a lot of bus drivers driving our students. Um, they've been exposed and conversely, they've exposed others. That's just how it is. And so um, we thought we really need to work with First Student, our partner, and, and open that up to them as well. So we, we feel really proud of that. Um, we have had tests completed as of Saturday, 1,340 tests. Um, 896 of those were negative, 444 were positive. So our overall positivity since November has been 33.1. And what I want you to remember, this is a test that we're using for people that are symptomatic. They've got COVID-like symptoms, okay? And many of them are household contacts or they've been a close contact. And that's what we're looking at. Now, when we had our meeting last week and Ms. Logan was there with our COVID advisory council, she said, Kimber, I like the overall stuff, but you need to break it down. We wanna see what it's looked like each week. So if you'll move on to the next slide, Terry, um, we have a breakdown of our symptomatic rapid antigen testing. So when you're looking at this bar graph, the dark uh, teal color is representing staff members, the number of staff that were tested that week, and the aqua color are the students. And then in yellow, we've got family members, and then the orange color is first student. So you can look there and see, we've tested more staff than anyone, but I want you to look over to the side um, right before Christmas, that week of 1214 and 1218, and then last week when we returned, look at how our family members, meaning family members of our students and staff have come out to get tested, okay? And this testing, just so you know, they're not coming in our building. It's the drive up testing. Uh, when you pull in off of Edgemore, you see five signs that say health services with a phone number on it that they call when they get here. I wanna tell you, our district, when we try to implement something like this, they come together and make things happen. It's pretty amazing to, to watch all these things happen so that we can support our families and our students and our staff members. So um, I know that uh, Ms. Logan wanted me to point out, when you look at the week of 11.30 to 12.04, I've got a big star up there. And that shows that the red line is how many people tested positive for that week. So during that week, we had 81 people that tested positive, um, and that was a 35.1% positivity, okay? Our staff members were at a 34.6%, students were 38.3%, we didn't have any family members that week that tested positive, and first student was 27.3%. So if you move over, you can see how many tested positive each week. And I know she wanted to compare this last week that we came back, January 4th through um, the 8th. And so when we look at that, we had 106 positive cases, all right? So our, but we tested less people, okay? So we look at that and um, we are, actually we tested more people. We tested 305 there, but we had 106 positive. So that was 34.8. So consistently our positivity rate has been 35.1, 35, 38.6, and then 34.8 last week. And so we take a look at this and, and, and you can see where we started out back in November, um, we didn't do as many tests, but the number of people testing positive was less. Uh, we always have the most, is the most we'd had was 43.4% of staff members 
in one week. That was the 14th through the 18th of December. I'm going to tell you, it was hopping in uh, HR. It was hopping in our testing site. The nurses were busy. They were ready for Christmas break. I can tell you that with all the contact tracing. So um, we had one week, the 7th through the 11th, where our family members were up to 44.4% of positivity. So we're, we're seeing an increase in there, ever so slight. And then this last week, it dipped down to that 34.8%. Um, I know that the girls that were working in the lab today um, saw a lot of cases. I didn't have time to gather that data for you, but we'll have it as we go. But I wanted you to see a timeline each week and how it looked for um, staff and students and families with our tests. So overall, like I said, all the weeks, 33.1% positivity. So our next uh, slide is to talk about the saliva PCR testing. This can be used to test symptomatic or asymptomatic, but we're using it in our district to test asymptomatic folks. And it works great that way. It's easy to do. Um, people aren't afraid of us um, sticking a nasopharyngeal swab back in their throat and tickling their brain is what they say. Um, <laughs> Our rapid antigen just goes in about one inch and is twirled around for five seconds. It's really just tickles. But this is pretty easy to do. We had three-year-olds on Saturday that were able to fill the container with some saliva, so that was kind of cool. Um, we began this the very beginning of December, that uh, first week, the third and the fourth, and we just kind of did a soft rollout where we had, okay, AMAC, SSC, Come on down, everybody, let's do some saliva testing. And then we invited um, Curtis Middle School and Caldwell staff to come over just so we could get the process down before we unleashed this. And um, then we started uh, opening it up for uh, family members of our staff members and for students. And then we went to several schools where sport teams had a positive case. And so when we had those kids, you know, when they're running and they don't have masks on, even though they're not by each other within six feet for 10 minutes, but they have that frequent crossing. So we set up times to go out when they would show up normally for practice so the kids could get there. And we would test the teams with the, um, the saliva PCR test and have the results back the next day. And also with the um, modified quarantine, We've been able to get people back to work sooner or back to sports and play sooner. If they're asymptomatic and they get tested um, day six or seven, they can return on day eight if they're asymptomatic. And so we've been using that a lot this week, especially with staff members that are in quarantine. I think it'll be really beneficial for us um, when we do return uh, in person. So when we look at our testing, our overall percentage of positivity is 5.5%, which is that was is what you would want to see because these are people that are asymptomatic. So we've had 56 positive tests out of the whole 1,023 there. Okay, we can move on. Um, here's another bar graph. And as you can see, when we started out with the asymptomatic saliva PCR, um, we primarily had staff members working in there, and then you'll see we started adding more students and then family members and first student, but it's still been pretty consistent that our staff members are taking advantage of this, this wonderful service that we can do for free. Um, so it's been working out great, but if you look at the stars, well, I didn't have anything back on the 30th because we hadn't started yet, but we had three that first week and um, when we look at that, that was a 3.2% positivity. And then um, it's gradually gone up, if you look at that. Uh, we went up to 6.4% um, the week before Christmas. That was a, a tough week. And, and you remember on Sedgwick County's website, it, it looked pretty ugly on there. Um, the fourth through the eighth, 9.1% um, is where we got up to with the asymptomatic testing. So um, this is 
I will tell you, we've had people that said, you know what, I've been testing every Friday just to make sure before I go visit my parents on the weekend and then boom, that one Friday right before Christmas, um, a staff member and her husband both tested positive and they were grateful. They, they were so grateful that they were able to find out so that they would not furthermore spread anything to someone else or especially someone that was compromised. So it it's, serves many purposes to get our kids and our staff back to work or to school and but also to protect others so that we know when we need to isolate and contact close contacts and things like that. So uh, does anybody have questions about this data before I move on to how, what we're gonna be doing in the future? Anything that doesn't make sense? I'm seeing none here. Mike or Ron, do you have questions? I do not. Okay. I have nothing. Okay. I guess okay, I have. Oh, Ben? Uh, yeah. Uh, ben Blankley, District 1. Um, so um, how, f how frequently, I, I know you mentioned some people are, are opting to get tested every week, mm -hmm. um, but like how, how big could we, can we scale this realistically? Uh, that's a good question. So you're thinking about how could we scale this like, you know, when people come into work each day, could they, if they wanted to, could they do a saliva PCR test? Is that, is that kind of what you're thinking? Or, yeah. or if every Monday we tested uh, people in this, this uh, quadrant or... Um, yeah, so like uh, personally, um, I, have, I am now reporting in person to work at, at Spirit and because of the particular uh, circumstances of my employment, they're requiring us to do this exact same saliva mm -hmm. PCR test once a week, mm -hmm. but there's a lot less of us um, there than, than our district em, uh, employs. So. Absolutely, and, and um, what I like about the saliva PCR test is that you, know, you don't have to have somebody else administer the, the, get the specimen for you or administer anything to you. We, what we do need to do is we scan a barcode for those of you that have not uh, been tested in our PCR clinic. It's, it's here in room 510 at AMAC. Uh, we scan a barcode that is linked to all of your demographic information. And so that's the bigger piece is doing the, the collecting the saliva is not the hard part of it. And it's not even hard to enter the demographic information, but we have to make sure we scan that or type in that 16 digit barcode. But I will tell you, WSU is working on some possible apps and things that people could log in, they could do their saliva test and put it into the system. So I think that that will be coming where we can do some things like that. We do have um, staff members that are uh, working in that testing center now that um, we will no longer have walk-in eight to three like we were but we will still be doing testing um, by appointment because we have a lot of people in quarantine. So we're looking at when we go back to schools where we're gonna use this starting out is if we see cases, like this would have been great back when we were looking at the schools that we needed to shut down um, earlier this year where we could go out and we could offer this when we start to see uh, you know, some linkages in cases or an increase in cases, we can go and do this testing right there at the school. Okay. Be great. Thank you. But at this point, I don't think we're ready for over 8,000 staff to do it once, once a week yet. We got to work those things out, but it's a goal and I like goals. So I think that's, that's good. Awesome. Okay. So talking about the future, um, I, I mentioned last Saturday, um, it was pretty awesome. We set everything up on Friday here at AMAC and we held a um, saliva PCR clinic for asymptomatic people, for our staff members and their families from eight to noon. We had 10, uh, we had 10 nurses and health room assistants. We even had Miss Wendy Johnson helping us with giving kids promotions and helping with traffic. Um, but we tested 170 uh, people. We had uh, 94 staff members, 14 students, 61 family members, and one first student. 
uh, member. And out of those 170 folks that were all asymptomatic, now some of them were close contacts, but they were asymptomatic, mm -hmm. maybe. So, um, or they've had a case in their house and they never got it. But we had 14 people out of 170 that tested positive. So that's an 8.2% positivity rate. Okay, so it's just interesting to look at these numbers on that because those people were grateful to find out that, you know, before they, if, if we decide to come back to school, they're like, well, I'm sure glad that I got tested and, you know, wouldn't want to come back and spread that. So um, there's a lot of things that we can do with this. And if you're wondering about those 14 positive, 10 of those were staff members, two were remote students, and two were family members. So that's, that was the breakdown of that. So we're gonna do this again this um, Saturday the 16th and Saturday the 23rd from eight to noon. And it's just walk-in. We have um, five people doing intakes. It goes really smooth. And uh, we also layered on we did a study this weekend and we offered if people wanted to do the nasal swab for the rapid antigen because what KDAG has said with the test we use for that, if you do screening with that rapid antigen where it's looking for the proteins and someone's asymptomatic, okay, and they were to test positive, we would have to get a confirmatory PCR test anyway. So they said, we really don't have any data. And so I said, well, we're gonna offer it and see if anybody wants to come over and get a little swab and we're gonna compare the results. So we're gonna do that um, so we can run some data on these tests too that'll be available for in our state. So kind of exciting. Um, we did a mobile PCR testing clinic today at one of our high schools with one of the teams that were close contacts. And so we'll continue to, as we need to, go out to buildings and whether it's for staff, students, um, coaches, whatever we need to do. And then our symptomatic rapid antigen testing will still continue at AMAC between the hours of eight and three when school is in session by appointment and it's drive up only. No one gets out of their car. Um, we come out to you in full PPE and complete those tests. Okay, so the big question Last fall, it was, when are we gonna start testing? And now it's, when are we gonna get shots? When are we gonna get <laughs> vaccinations? I never thought so many people would want to get a shot and a vaccination. I've get an, had a lot of emails, phone calls, and a lot of people asked me about it Saturday when we were working here. Um, and so I want you to know that we are on the list. We have not been forgotten. If you look at number two up there, this is what Governor Kelly, um, her new graph that she put out on the 7th. And so we are on the list with the second group, okay? And I promise you, I think I, I'm to stalker level with KDHE asking about when we're gonna get vaccines. So um, I, I'm being nice, but I'm leaving a lot of messages um, so and emails. So I am advocating for all of you. I am. I got my first dose of vaccine on December 29th, and I, we need to be proud of our school nurses. With Sedgwick County Health Department, they started over Christmas break that week of the 29th and the 30th of December. Since then, we have filled over 96 shifts administering COVID vaccine. And I am just amazed at that. And we're doing that for our community so that we can keep moving forward and get to the other people that need to be vaccinated as well. So I, I just wanna give them a hand, um, the work that they're doing with testing, but also with the vaccines as well, and Sedgwick County too. Um, so when this happens, this is the exciting thing. Um, we have developed a survey that's gonna be going out. Uh, it'll come from me this week, and it's a COVID-19 vaccine survey. And we wanna be prepared, because I will tell you, when Sedgwick County found out they were getting vaccines, they had 48 hours notice. Okay, 
So we want to be have a plan and be prepared. So when you get this uh, survey from me, Kimber Kazitz, please take a look at it. Even if you don't want the vaccine, answer that. We need to know so we can tell them how many vaccines we need to have and we can start making a tiered plan of who would be vaccinated first according to risk, okay? And we're, we're gonna do it fairly. I mean, but we have to have a system to be able to do this. On this survey, it has a link right to the CDC with all the factual information about the COVID vaccine. I want people to read that and know that they're being informed. And the first question will say, will you sign up to receive the COVID-19 vaccine when it becomes available to you? Yes, no, or unsure. If you click yes or unsure, it's gonna pop up more information. We're gonna get some demographic, your name, we're gonna find out what your position is, what building you're at, your cell phone number, and your email. And are you age 65 or older? No, I am not. But, um, and do you have any health conditions that place you in a high-risk category if you were to get COVID-19? And if you click yes, then it asks you to list those. And then if you clicked no, like I am not getting poked and I'm not getting the vaccine, I don't get a flu shot, I don't do any of that. I think everybody should get it, but that's how it is. As a nurse, I want everybody to be protected. So we're gonna ask you, please share the reason that you do not wish to receive the COVID-19 vaccine below. So we can figure out what, you know, is it something that we've done, we've not provided enough education, you don't feel secure, or maybe you, you can't do it because of a health condition. So it's not anything secret. I wanted to be open about this. This is gonna help us plan and be prepared for when the vaccines come in because they will come in, it's just a matter of when, okay? So I think that is exciting news there. Okay, I'll take it from here. Uh, as Dr. Thompson said, uh, what we have for you now is a recommendation. Uh, and she stated earlier, we needed to plan. So information has gone out that indicated to people that this decision was before you this evening and to be prepared. And you'll also see later on, we're gonna tell people to be prepared yet again, uh, because we know with COVID that is a constant. So the current recommendation before you is that on-site elementary students will return on Wednesday, two days from now, January 13th. Already in the plans, pre-K students would return on January 14th, that's the earliest that they would return. All staff would return to on-site teaching and work on 112 tomorrow elementary and others 113. In terms of students returning to school, middle and high school students return on Monday 125th, which is the beginning of the second semester. And of course, uh, any student that is receiving a temporary services plan uh, has been and possibly still is receiving on-site services. Always wanna make sure that everyone is aware that we are meeting the needs of our students in regards to temporary uh, uh, service plans. These, whether you're on-site or remote, is based on parent choice. As you know, you gave them two opportunities before school started in uh, July to make a determination in regards to on-site and remote. And then again, uh, in December, you gave them another opportunity to do that. Uh, so currently, in the first semester, they're still going based on what decision they made in July, and then starting January 25th, that would change if those students changed. One of the things that we found when we looked at the numbers is that they've remained surprisingly consistent with about 60% of our student and our families choosing to go on site should that opportunity present it to them, and 40% remote. We had some changes, but the changes one way kind of offset the changes the other way. Uh, either way, we feel like we have the capacity to, to handle the students in terms of on-site and remote. The reason we feel that way is the presentation that you received on October 20th, and that was the blended on-site model <coughs> for secondary. And a reminder of that schedule is Monday through Tuesday, uh, students with the last name A through L would go on-site. Wednesday, everyone is in a remote learning capacity, and then Thursday through the Friday, that A through L would go remote, and then the exact opposite for M through Z. And of course, we worked with families 
Uh, if you had students with different last names, uh, we worked that around so that's not an absolute concrete. That gives the people the opportunity to meet the needs of the families uh, as they selected. Uh, just an example, East High, our largest high school, has approximately 2,200 students. 1,300 have chosen on-site, uh, and 900 have chosen remote learning. With the blended, that would mean approximately 650 students would be there on Monday, Tuesday. 650 students would be there on Thursday and Friday. So if you visualize the size of that building and the capacity of that building, uh, that, that's kind of the numbers that you would see in regards to that. And again, we will continue to serve the students that have those temporary services plans and their IEPs. Uh, difficult situation, uh, as we've stated before. As a part of the community discussion that we had, these are the high points that we got out of that community discussion. And you can see, Kimber already said, we're already covering point one. Be organized and be ready uh, when the vaccine makes itself available. And that's one of the reasons that we're doing the surveys. Give teachers time to transition to back to on-site classrooms. That's one of the reasons that information was sent out prior to this meeting. And again, the recommendation that you have tonight. Uh, consider transitioning elementary on January 5th rather than January 13th. That was one of the points that was put out there. Uh, one of the discussions, or a couple of the discussions that we've had every time we've had a meeting is, of course, that social and emotional health and also the academic data. Uh, one of the things that was provided to us by Dr. Netson, who was on that community committee, and she has been here and talked to you on a couple of occasions, that she has seen two to three times increase in the number of suicide attempts. Very, very fortunately, the number of successful suicides remains about the same, but she's seeing an increase in suicide attempts. That's one of the main concerns that we have in terms of that social emotional is data. Uh, the other question was re uh, academic data needed to be compared uh, remote and on site. That's an ongoing process, and our academic folks are currently working on that to get you information in regards to that. Uh, one of the other things that we discussed in the community was the fact that we are asking for input, uh, and we are trying our best to listen to people in regards to their input. As Dr. Thompson said at the beginning of this, this is not an easy decision, and you're not gonna make everybody happy, but we are trying to listen to people in regards to the input. And yes, we get input both ways, even additional ways. Uh, you, you should, you shouldn't. Um, it, it's just a variety of things, and that's what makes your job incredibly difficult. One of the other things that came out of the community advisory committee discussion in regards to input was the fact that the local districts in our area are going on site. Uh, and that's a discussion I know that you guys have had uh, in past as well in terms of the equitability, in terms of how we're providing education to students compared to uh, the districts that are in our area. Again, focusing on illness and focus, monitoring on illness and focusing on safety, uh, we continue to look at these numbers on a regular basis. We'll continue to monitor staff illness, staff quarantines, student illness and attendance. Those are all numbers that we look on a regular basis. We continue to monitor the availability of our substitutes, our central office teaching support staff. Right before uh, you went to full remote, you know that we, you heard a plan where we're using our central office support staff to go out and support our on-site learning folks out in the schools. We'll continue to monitor those numbers and try to use people as best as possible. And as we did uh, in uh, late 2020, should data or health trends warrant, individual buildings may be closed for on-site learning. Uh, we've found the value in treating things from a classroom point of view, from a school building point of view, and from a district point of view. And that's that ability to pivot at different levels based on the need. And again, you look at the athletic side, some, uh, some uh, teams have had to be set down, other teams continue to work, uh, and that's part of the COVID, uh, the COVID situation that we see nationwide. As we say, prior to here and also after here, parents should be pre prepared. No matter what your decision is, we're liable to change it sometime in the near future. So we always want our parents to be prepared. That's one of the reasons we set out information. With a child care plan and event, their child's building needs to transfer, transfer transition from temporarily to full remote. Uh, it's out there. We know that the needs of the community, we know the changing numbers in regard to COVID, 
uh, and we monitor those and give that information to you as best we can. So to summarize this presentation, uh, we emphasize, 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 wear your mask, wash your hands, social distance, stay home if you're sick. And we now have found that with the additional testing, we can provide even more information and stay home if you have COVID. You may not have symptoms, but we give people the opportunity to test, even if they're asymptomatic, and that's helping us in our decision making. So that's the presentation that we have this, this afternoon or this evening. I'll turn it over to um, Ms. Logan, Dr. Thompson. Is there anything you want to add, Dr. Thompson? No? Okay, then we're open for discussion. The recommendation is on the table, but there is no, obviously, no uh, motion. It's simply a recommendation from the, from the administrative team. And again, it's in your presentation, and it's, if you could pull that up on the screen for me, please. Oh, thank you. Uh, On-site elementary students return Wednesday the 13th. On-site pre-K students return Thursday the 14th. All staff returns on-site for teaching and work on 112 for elementary and 113 for the others. Middle and high school students return Monday the 25th, which is the beginning of the second semester. And our special ed on-site students will continue as they have been all along. Okay, I'm op it is open for discussion. And Mike and Ron, if you're interested in discussion, please just say something since I can't see you. Will do. Okay, thanks. Ben? I figured I start because somebody has to. Um, ben Blankley, District 1. Um, so uh, the equity concerns um, kind of, you know, with the presentation that we had tonight um, kind of is in the forefront of my mind uh, right now. Um, and that, that our, our suburb districts, especially last fall um, when we had all of our secondary students out, um, a lot of our suburb districts uh, kept secondary students in. And so that was a, a significant difference in uh, educational equity for our students and, and uh, particularly our secondary students at that time. And I, I, would, I would be hesitant to try to intentionally repeat that. Um, it it, it, it seems, you know, it, it's, it's hard to quantify a gut feeling um, but that's kind of the situation we're in because um, we, we, we're inundated with data um, and, uh, and all of us are, are, are reading, I mean, how many news articles do we read each day? Um, and so, yeah, there's, there's equity uh, concerns are a real, f really forefront in my mind. Um, something else I noticed uh, when we were doing we we're doing the rapid antigen symptomatic testing of staff, students, family members, um, we continued to do that when we were in full remote mode mm -hmm. and everybody was home, um, and the numbers basically went up at the same trajectory as our community's numbers. And I mean, we've all said this before last year that. Our, you know, our schools are not islands, they're, they're microcosms of our larger community with all the benefits and problems they're in. Um, and so, I mean, it's not a statistical, you know, data analysis, but it, it really feels like um, us going remote didn't necessarily prevent cases in our staff and students. It may have, but it doesn't appear that it did. Um, it appears like just general community spread, a rise in that over the course of November and December uh, led to that corresponding rise in, in, in our staff and, and students. Um, the recommendation as, as put forward, uh, I received um, lots of input um, over the past couple days. Uh, I think, I think starting everybody on at semester time makes more sense. I understand the reasoning behind the kind of phased in approach, um, but like I, I had coworkers today that came up to me and said, 
okay, my, my kids with my spouse, and then we're going to have to come up with a new plan for like two days, and then we've got Martin Luther King Day and a staff in-service day, and then it's the end of the semester, and, and they, it, they, they were, and, and these are college-educated professionals, and, and they were relatively unprepared for a sharp transition that we would be um, engaging them in if we approve this recommendation as written. And so, um, so then, of course, I worry, you know, check my own privilege as a, you know, as a white, middle-aged working professional. Um, there, I've got access to a lot of resources that a lot of people don't, um, and, I'm, and I am at a loss of how I would react to that quick of a switch in my child's learning model, um, especially because of how frequently we've, uh, for better or for worse, done those quick switches to our families this past uh, year. So um, if we can avoid intentionally doing that again, I think that's worth exploring, even if it's tougher on our system um, to do that. Um, and I also think uh, we, we already have, uh, in terms of staffing, um, we already have a difference in, in like, work environment depending on what each staff member does. I mean, we have, we have our school nurses that are in full PPE contacting 30% positive COVID cases. Um, we've got our special education teachers and paras, um, some of whom haven't, uh, don't, don't have the opportunity to work from home. And so with that in mind, I don't think it's a much further uh, change in our work environment um, inequity uh, to say that if you're teaching remotely, you should be able to continue to work from home, especially because we did that based upon Dr. Menz's order, and his order is the same now as it was in November, um, with the suggestion that anyone that can work remotely should work remotely. Um, so I think those two pieces, um, a unified start, a unified start in person, um, with of course the caveat that any school, any classroom at any time could have to go back out. Um, and also uh, that remote teachers should be able to continue to work from home if they so choose. Dr. Thompson, before we have further discussion. Would you, because I know there was thinking behind why your recommendations came in as they did, could you kind of give us your thinking on those two items, uh, semester versus the 13th, and the everybody working, that if they're remote, they can work from home? Yeah, sure. Um, we, there was so many different conversations happening at different groups. We've met with principals, we've met with the COVID task force, and then we also have had opportunities to um, listen to people from operations divisions and so on and so forth. And the phasing in piece came from us not being confident uh, that with all of the schools coming back at one time, so if they all came back on the 13th, the 25th, whatever day you bring them back, would the system be able to support itself uh, as it relates to substitutes, uh, you know, we've had people that have been um, fur uh, not furloughed, but um, that have been off since we've not been working. Um, and so you just have all of these dynamics and to start all at one time, we thought it would be easier on the system, just like you said, to really kind of phase it in. So you start out one week with elementary. We even talked about middle school coming in at a second week. And then the third week we would bring in our high school students. Um, and then we had, you know, then we did some more talking to people and getting more input and we shifted actually middle school to come back with the high schools on the 25th of semester. So again, we did a lot of feedback, a lot of conversations to get us to that point of that felt like it would be easier for everyone and we wouldn't put too much tax on the system as far as substitutes coming back in after the first of the year and all of those kinds of things. And that really was our only reason why we talked about that phasing in and we didn't want to phase in 
later because then we would be messing with the middle school and the high schools with their semester piece. So we wanted to get everybody in by semester and the phase and approach, we just backed ourselves out and that's how we got there. So it was that the system could support bringing people back in? That, that was our thinking. So I'm open, you know, again, we're here for discussion, but that was our thinking as we talked about the phasing in model. And what about the, the people that are still remote, which basically after our secondary people come in with the blended learning, it would just be elementary remote would be all that would still be full remote. Is that, that, is, correct? that is correct. And again, as we stated from the very beginning, the only reason why we made that decision is because of the equity piece. Just trying to make sure that we're not sending a message to our staff that one group is worthy to work from home versus another group. That was the only rationale and the reason why that, that was a tour, that was kind of a, a, a kind of a lengthy conversation as well. Because we know that if there are less people in a building, you know, that's less opportunities for people to contract or spread or whatever the case may be. So that was one of the reasons why we brought said bring back is because of the equity piece. And that was the only reason why that decision was made, for a recommendation anyway. Okay, thank you. Uh, Ernestine. Well, one of the things that's, uh, to me, that's for postponing it a little, this is an idea for postponing it a little, either a few days or to the semester, is that We've seen that it was at 23, and then it was at 12 a few days ago, and then uh, Ms. Moses, you just said earlier today, it's at 11.2, I believe, was this on the, on the slides. So that as we move a few days, even to next week, we'll, we are being honest with our COVID gating criteria that we set to begin with which let's face it, we were guessing in the dark. We were trying to find what we didn't know about and nobody in the world knew about we were doing. But nonetheless, it does stay within our COVID. Uh, if we hold off just a few days and wait for it to drop another uh, point and get below the 10%. But one of the things I wanna suggest is if we start on Wednesday, that's three days this week. Monday is a Martin Luther King holiday, and then there's three days the following week, and then is, am I correct that elementary also has the 22nd off for teacher, I mean the children would have it off. The teachers have that as a work day on the last day of the semester, even the elementary do that. Elementary, middle, and high, yes ma'am. Okay, so we have three days this week, and then three days next week with the Martin Luther King holiday in the middle, and then another break at the end of the week, and then the start of the semester. So the idea of having the parents continue with their learning plan, I mean their childcare plan, now through the 22nd, would, and start again on the 25th and in person, would give them a solid. But I want to just propose to think about this idea. If we had them continue this week remotely and teachers had a work day this coming Friday to be able to transit, elementary I'm referring to, to transition, the parents would have Friday and Monday of their children not needing to be in school so that it would be a little bit easier for them if they wanted to have a four-day weekend together. Then instead of uh, starting on this Wednesday, we would start the following Tuesday and we'd be back in school Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday with elementary. Now I will tell you that you and I know that probably those three days are not gonna be all that educationally sound as kids are beginning to get back into the school and they're trying to get it but it does allow them to dip, get that and then be ready to hit the ground really hard running at the beginning of the new semester. Maybe I'm being unfair to teachers, but I think when they first get the kids back in school, there's gonna be some hubbub there 
as teachers, but it gives Friday for teachers to bring their materials, their, their computers back, and it gives them also the chance to be, have time over the weekend to plan in-person lessons. And then they can be spectacular when they start. This is just a thought to consider. I really am with Ben in general to think that we need to start the new semester, but I'm just seeing this as a possible compromise to move it up just a little bit instead of trying to start it within less than 48 hours from now. Again, I'm gonna refer to Dr. Thompson. Um, can you kind of let us know, because I know I, I'm on the call list to when announcements go out from the district and I got calls on Friday about your proposed plan. What is the thinking as far as getting teachers to be able to give them time to get their stuff back in? Um, the plan currently as on the document that you have received and has been explained, the teachers would be working in their classroom on tomorrow um, and they would be preparing themselves so they'll have an opportunity to bring their computers back and those kinds of things and then prepare in their classrooms and then they would start the following day. So, so that they is wouldn't the, be in, they, they wouldn't be teaching children remotely tomorrow? Uh, no. In the morning or, or all day? Asynchronous. A asynchronous, which means that students would be doing their lessons on their own tomorrow while the teachers are preparing their classrooms. If the teachers had been able to make that kind of lesson plan today to do, give to them for tomorrow. That is what we were trying to say, how difficult this has been to yeah. try to plan because they have already done that we're just waiting on a decision from you all, right. and we were just trying to be prepared right. for whatever decision right. you all would make. Right. Okay. So they are prepared for that, Thank you. one Stan. way or the other, so they're prepared. Okay, Stan? Stan, Research District 4. <clears throat> Dr. Thompson, when we made the decision on November 30th uh, to go full remote, uh, how long did it take before we emptied the buildings or the students? Um, we were on the 30th. I think it took us, well, we gave teachers this time two, to two days to transition because they did not have, the teachers that were teaching face-to-face -face needed opportunity to do professional development. So we, moved, we shut down all of the schools for two days so that the teachers could get professional development, get their equipment set up at home, and work with their colleagues on developing lessons to move forward. So in so, two to three days, we were down? We were down two. Okay. I, I believe it was two. What is, what is our largest suburban districts doing? Uh, when did they go back after winter break? Are you talking about around us? Around us. They went back to school Jan the first, well, January 4th. That was the first day back from school. They went all back January 4th. Um, and what is the Kansas Department of Education and the uh, Kansas Board of Education uh, saying about in-person learning? Um, there was a State Board of Education meeting um, that happened sometime in December where the State Board of Education and the Commissioner of Education made a, an announcement, a statement, that they wanted all elementary in particular to be back on site as soon as possible. And they said that, um, that we could only kind of, they, recommend, they strongly recommended that we not close or shut down any more schools unless there were um, staffing issues. So that was kind of their strong recommendation from the State Board of Education as well as the commissioner. And then he came out and made that statement publicly and they've it's been in articles and things of that nature across the state. And my last question, would you say it's fair to say that the 65% of our families that uh, selected in-person learning, uh, their reason for that selection was because they felt they knew what their child or what their particular situation was and for learning to occur, they needed in-person learning. Would you say that's correct on the 65%? That's 65% uh, of elementary, if I'm correct. Well, yeah, and I can't speak for parents and what sure. their opinions are, but I would make an assumption 
um, and which could be wrong and a bad thing to do. Uh, but uh, that 65% of their students, they chose for their children to be face to face. And I'm assuming that that was because that's what learning model they wanted for their children to have. Because logically, if you would say, here's a zero chance that anybody in your household would ever get COVID, or you have a choice of sending your child to school and there is that chance, there is that possibility, and they still chose in person, they obviously chose that, not because they wanna get their child sick or they wanna bring anything into their household. They brought, it home, they brought it into their house because they feel strongly on what that household, what that child needs in their education. And I'm just seeing, asking if, if that's fair on what I'm, I'm, I'm saying. I would say that 65% of the parents in elementary selected that they wanted their children to be to school face to face and that was best for their family. I mean, that's why they chose that. Thank you. Ben? Yes, Ben Blankley, District 1. Um, so uh, a little sidebar, um, is a couple, well, not a couple, a lot of people, because there were a lot of people contacting us, so every segment has a lot of people in it. Um, we're wondering if we could delay in-person learning until all staff were vaccinated. And so I guess maybe a question for Kimber. Uh, could, could we walk through like, what would that, e what would that look like? Um, yes, Kimber Kazitz, Director of Health Services. First and foremost, um, we're not mandating that everyone gets vaccinated. Um, that's not been a discussion as a district that we would do that. And when you um, talk to the epidemiologists and the people that work in the vaccine world and you talk about herd immunity, to see a big impact with the vaccines, um, you really need to see like 75% or so of the large groups of people getting vaccinated to see the full impact, okay? And so um, I, I think a lot of, I think that um, obviously I'm for the vaccine. I got my first dose as a healthcare provider and doing COVID testing. Um, but you know, I'm not fully protected just with one dose of the vaccine. And I think that's something we need to remember. With the Moderna vaccine, it's 28 days between your doses. So that's a whole nother month after you actually get your first vaccine, okay? And then, um, so I, I think that would be difficult to do because not everyone is going to get vaccinated, just like not everyone will get their flu shot. Um, I have seen some people that are typically kind of anti-vaxxers or anti-flu shot people that have said they want to get the COVID vaccine, um, you know, because they're thinking about other people as well, protecting themselves and protecting others. So um, I just don't, I think that's pretty lofty for us to think that every employee is going to get vaccinated. If every employee wants to get vaccinated, we're gonna do everything we can to get them vaccinated and to get the vaccines. But I, I don't know that we're gonna have 100% of our staff wanting to get vaccinated. Okay. Julie? Um, Dr. Thompson, um, you know, we, in October, we decided on um, the blended model for middle school and high school and anticipated that we were gonna move to that. And then, in, um, and then in November had to, because the numbers were up, uh, had to go fully remote. But also part of that fully remote decision was because of our staff numbers. Um, are you, are, do you feel more, clearly you must, but can you talk to us about, do you feel more comfortable now um, as we move forward? that we are gonna have uh, the ability to cover classrooms, have subs. Are, are we not as concerned uh, today as we were in November about that, those staff I am not issues? gonna promise anything because that gets you in trouble. So I will not make any commitment that I feel more confident that we're gonna have subs 
uh, in the classrooms because that's, uh, that's not gonna be accurate. I will say that we will do our best to do what we can. We know that bringing back secondary is going to create more obstacles. However, we do see that the numbers are going down to a, a level that we feel that we may be able to, but again, I can't promise that, and I can't say that we're going to have subs every day in the buildings to support everything. So I, I won't say yes, but what I can say is that the numbers are down, and it looks as if we could do better than we did in, the, in, the, um, in November. That is why we talked about this phasing in approach so that we could test the waters a little bit to see what we have before we continue to add them all in at the same time. So again, that is the reason why the phase in and why we picked the dates that we picked. It was just to get us to that semester and to phase them in according to the levels. Well, so, I would assume your discussions about having the testing available and, and starting to get some people vaccinated, I, I, I would assume that those factors also enter into thinking. That is correct, that, that is correct. Because what'll end up happening is, is you know, you have a, a lot of folks who have already contracted the virus. So those mm -hmm. folks also now are kind of treated a little bit differently, even with quarantining. So that's gonna take out a group. And then we have a new quarantine rule that we have. And so what we thought was, is our thinking is, but again, we don't know. <laughs> but you would kind of assume that we would have less people quarantining. Then by the time we get secondary back on the 25th, we would hope that we would start getting some vaccination going on inside of our schools, which would then help. But again, you're not 100% you know, sure that you're not going to get the vaccine. I mean, the virus if you get a vaccination because it's only 50%. So again, but it gives us better chance to make it. And then 28 more, 28 more days, 21, depending on, upon the the um, the types of vaccines that we get, then we could then make it until the finish line. Right. So we're kind of, I mean, literally that was our thinking. But it's no guarantee with anything. But right. we were trying to see how we could get kids back if we could. And then because there's no guarantee, that's why you're wanting your families to be prepared that if we do have a staff shortage at a particular site, that that particular site would be shut down as opposed to eliminating the possibility for the entire district for students to have on that is learning. that is correct and so we were trying to then be able to isolate specific classrooms or buildings and be able to to uh, shut those down and that's why it's so important I mean people say we don't give them a notice but we we've, we say this every time that you could be in and out and we've said that from the very beginning that there could be opportunity I mean it is uncomfortable it is it is inconvenient it is, it is not what we would, that's not how we typically operate, jerking people in and out, but it is COVID. And I'm not sure how else we get kids in and people out without the disruption of moving your stuff, moving here, doing this. It's just part of what it is. And I know it's not what we want to be asking people to do, but it's just reality. My, my second question is, um, I, I know in addition to the COVID uh, um, advisory team that you've also been in constant contact with our team of doctors and they, their opinion has been important to this board at every meeting. Um, um, there was a comment about the mental health doctor um, referring to it being important uh, for kids to be back in school. What, what were the comments of the other doctors? Um, pretty much, just pretty much the same. Um, you know, uh, we, we've just got to stay diligent with wearing those masks on site. Um, people, when they, we can't tell people what to do when they're on their own, but we, we, we have to stay away from large groups, gatherings at home, we have to wash our hands and social distance as much as possible, stay out of the restaurants and the bars and those kinds of things is what they continue to stress upon us to stress to our people. That's why a lot of others are able to stay open longer and others, because they are really honing in on safety of themselves outside of the school so that we can stay in school. 
And that's what they kind of have continuously tell us is to do those things and we can have the opportunity to keep our schools open uh, until till the end. Um, that was one thing that, that was very strong on the others, but they all are concerned about the elementary. Um, secondary, you know, they, you know, we've done this for <laughs> this period of time, but the problem with the secondary is the attempts and the suicide. At the beginning, we didn't have very many of those. That's what kind of kept us feeling okay about being out. But when they started talking about two to three times, I think whatever she said, I wrote it down, mm -hmm. two to three times more suicide uh, attempts, that kind of sparked the, 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 um, the advisory team uh, about how quickly we need to start kind of moving ourselves back because we don't want something like that to happen. But then on the other side, you know, you got to also keep on in mind about the safety sure. of everyone uh, with the virus too. Sure. So it, it's, it's just not a win-win. It's just all kinds of dynamics that are starting to bubble. It's just, a, you know, that's just where we were yeah. with the meeting. Very difficult tonight, just like it has been every time we've met and had that to make one of these decisions. That is yeah. correct. Ernestine? I want to clarify something. Um, we are not talking about any of the families that have chosen my school remote. They just continue doing my school remote. We are not talking, well actually this discussion has been primarily about the ones that wanted in-person education, elementary. I almost suggest, I don't know from my colleagues here, but that we, it's almost like that we have a, a, a a sense of the group that with ele with the secondary that we would be okay with the idea of secondary going uh, to the split schedule on the beginning of the semester. So I was wondering if we could have a, a, a motion that deals with the secondary only and then come back and deal here with the elementary that are just the in-person elementary. And even, even if we don't split the the motion, we're only really dealing with with total of six academic days, three this week and three next week. So the idea of, of putting elementary to being the uh, end of the semester or the beginning of the next semester too, we're only really just extending from my school, we're extending, we are extending remote learning by just three days this week and three days next week. So it really isn't as big a deal one way or the other, except if families have to try to suddenly change things as far as childcare and they've got those holiday or got those uh, non-school days in there in the middle, or teachers that are having to make a change of teaching remotely and then suddenly have to do. So I think that I would definitely be in favor of us voting for the secondary to go back with our uh, hybrid plan of some students, to, half of the students going Monday, Tuesday, and half of the students Thursday, Friday. I would definitely be in favor of that. I am reluctant to push us, our elementary back in person schools so quickly when it could be the sec second semester also. But I'm... Are you making a motion? <laughs> well, I do, yes, I do move that we accept that the recommendation for our secondary school students to all go back to school at the beginning of the semester on January 25th, in which the what are we calling it? The hybrid plan? The blended. The blended plan. <laughs> the blended on site for secondary uh, plan be accepted. Okay, there is a motion on the floor. Do I hear a second? I think the motion died from lack of a second. Okay. Um, I have my name up next, but I want to ask Mike and Ron, since I can't see you and you can't log in, do you have anything that you want to add to this conversation? Wallace Hall, District 6. Um, I'd like to um, 
Ernestine's initial proposal, actually, uh, now that I looked at the calendar again, uh, with the students, with the elementary students starting on the 19th and the 15th at the end of the day, where uh, they're doing asynchronous, and then everybody coming in on the 25th. Um, so that's kind of my take on it, and judging from uh, nobody seconding me. Ernestine's other one, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if I should make a motion or how we could do that. Well, you can certainly make a motion or we can just discuss it and then make a motion later. It's up to you. you okay. Just... All right. Well, Mike, do you have anything other than why? Because I'll, I'll make a motion now if you don't have anything else. Go ahead. I make the motion that we uh, allow these elementary students to come in on January the 19th, Tuesday followed by secondary students on January the 25th, Monday. I second that. Okay, there is a motion on the floor that we return our elementary students on the 19th of January, so it gives our parents and our teachers a few more days, and then our secondary students on the 25th. What is not included in that motion, and it certainly can be a separate motion or whatever we want, is about our staffing and do they return on site and so on. So that's not part of your motion, but that is something that we need to discuss. Okay, Mike, do you have anything to add to this? I do not. Okay. Uh, there's a couple more people that wanna say something before we vote, so we'll do that if that's okay with you, Ron. Your motion is on the floor. Yes. Okay, um, I had my name up next, and honestly, I've s spent a lot of time on this, as we all have. Uh, this has not been an easy decision. I, I think there is logic for the 13th, even though that seems like it's really close. Parents and staff were all notified on Friday, and there, there's some logic in having that phase in time for our elementaries to get back in, get their kids reoriented because they're going to they're going to need that to kind of it's a little bit like coming back after summer or coming back after Christmas break. You need a little bit of reorientation time so that we can then hit the ground running at semester with those our littlest people, our elementary kids. And and you know, we could we could do it starting on the 19th it would just give us three days I don't think there's much difference between the 19th and the 13th as far as what teachers would have to do I, I, I just I kind of support the 13th myself I also think that because of having staff back on board in the buildings there is advantages in having all your staff in a building even if you're having discussions over the computer, there's still advantages in having staff in the building. I, I think there's a real advantage and because we're gonna have all of our secondary staff back with the with blended learning. They're, they will be doing remote, but they'll also be doing blended. Our elementary, 65% of them are gonna be back. And, and if we pull those other teachers in, then we have teams that can work as kids need to adjust. We have a, a, a student that needs to go out on remote automatically they're moved into another classroom that kind of thing because we are going to have some kids that'll need to be in quarantine and we'll need to go remote we know that's going to happen so I support that part of the recommendation as well uh, with that Stan Stan Research District 4 um, Ron, I'll probably be voting against that motion, and I'll tell you why, is because I'm not sure why you wouldn't capture um, the three days. If I'm, I'm gonna assume that Ernestine's done the calendar correct, I think you probably have, but why wouldn't you capture those three days in person if you could? Why wouldn't you capture the three days after that? Um, so I'm going to vote against it, Ron, but I know what you're, I, I understand the direction you're heading in. If your motion does fail, I'm going to make a motion to, that we take the recommended action. And I'll, 
And, yes, and I'll, and I'll, I think I'll spell out, basically read what's up on the recommendation board uh, for my motion, but that's obviously only if it fails. Okay. Uh, Ernestine? The, to me, the extra days allows, because it's not like we're going to be sending the kids home this week. The, on, uh, the uh, remote learning would still continue this whole week. Oh, yeah. And so that there would be no, uh, no gap, except if we take the Friday f to allow the teachers to get their materials back into schools and carry in their books, carry in their computers and that thing. So this is basically a work day on Friday. Monday is a, is a holiday. And so students coming back on Tuesday then, and teachers, and I don't see the issue of the, the staff thing being the same as being a part of this discussion. I'm not trying to say pro or con about the, the teachers, I mean the staff all coming in. But to me, that gives a, a lead in time this week for families. I've had several families that have contacted me about how that this is going to upset their childcare arrangements, that they've got somebody now that's taking care of their children every day, but they're going to have to now ask that person if they'll only take care of them, you know, on the holidays, on the, the day off, this sort of thing. My suggestion has to do with waiting for, because our COVID numbers are going down slowly, and right now we're at 11, that by next Monday, actually by a week from tomorrow, that I can believe that it will be at the 10, because it was at 12 last week, Friday. It's at 11 today, I believe by next week it'll certainly be. So that has a lot to do with it. The I believe that we need to sort of, we said this was our guideline, our, our gating criteria, and I think that that's a way that it doesn't feel quite so much like we're giving people whiplash. Okay. And I want to apologize to the board members. I know there was another speaker and when I hit it, it took it off. Who, who, who had put their name up? Was it you, Julie? Yeah, okay. Oh, okay. All right, uh, Mike and Ron, do you have anything else to add? Because there's no more speakers here at, at, on site and then we're gonna have a vote. No, I don't have anything. Okay, uh, then I will call for a vote because I see no other questions from the floor here. The motion was made by Ron, seconded by Ernestine, that we return the elementary students on January the 19th and the secondary students on January the 25th. So uh, we will need to take a voice vote on that. We'll start with Ernestine. Ernestine Crable, District 3, yes. Julie? Julie Hedrick, District 2, no. Cheryl Logan, uh, at large, no. Stan Reeser, District 4, no. Ben Blankley, District 1, no. Mike? Mike Brody, District 5, yes. Uh, Ron Salas, District 6, yes. Motion fails, 4 to 3. Stan? Uh, Stan Research District 4, um, I'd like to move that we take the recommended action that the Wichita Public School return, transition and return to on-site and remote learning models for elementary schools on January 13th and for pre-SKK students on January 14th. In addition, middle or high school will transition to the blended on-site and remote learning on January 25th. All staff will return into, uh, in person to their assigned building starting Wednesday, January 13th. The motion will not impact families who have selected the remote uh, learning model, such as what Ernestine was mentioning, for their student or are enrolled in education, Imagine Academy, or have a student who's already on site being served um, through a temporary service plan. I think that summarizes the recommendation. Did I leave out anything out, Mrs. President? No, I think you, I think you have it. That's the motion you want to make. Is there a second? 
I second Julie Hedrick, District 2. Okay, there is a motion by Stan Reeser and a second by Julie Hedrick. I'm seeing no discussion here. Mike and Ron, do you have any discussion on this motion? No, I'm Salas, District 6, no. Mike Brody, District 5, no. Okay, then we will vote. Let's begin with, are we all clear on what the motion is? Okay, begin with Ben. Ben Blankley, District 1, no. Stan Reeser, District 4, yes. Cheryl Logan, at large, yes. Julie Hedrick, District 2, yes. Ernestine Crable, District 3, no. Uh, Mike? Mike Rohde, District 5, yes. Ron? Ron Rosales, District 6, yes. Okay, the motion passes 5-2. So, Superintendent uh, Thompson, are you clear on what we should do? I think so. Um, I think so. Um, Mike, did you capture that? Okay, so I am clear because Mike has captured it, and, <laughs> and we will we will well, move we, we will move accordingly. Yeah, I think he just simply we had just adopted your recommendation. Except that there was one difference, and that all staff will return on the 13th instead of the 12th. The motion he said was that all staff would return on the 13th. Oh. I was trying to go off of that. Yeah. It's on the, the elementary. To, tomorrow they return because that gives them the day to, to do their build, come back in and get their computers back in. I didn't pick that up when you made the motion. Mike, I, did I you get that? I picked that up and I was almost going to say, did you mean that? But it, it puts everybody back at the same time instead okay, of. Okay, but that doesn't give us a day for the elementaries to bring their computers back in. So do we. We could re vote. We, yeah, we could, we could vote just on that one issue if we I had think a motion. that's what we should yeah. do is just vote yeah, on I that one that. issue. Okay, on the, on the one issue, does someone want to make a motion? Sure, I'll make a motion. Okay, Julie? I make a motion that all staff will return to on-site teaching work on 112 for the elementary and for 113 for all others. Stand Research District 4, yes, um, second. The motion was made by Julie that we have our elementary return on the 12th. That gives them the, the day to get their computers in. And other staff returns on the 13th. Now, in my understanding, that means that they will come tomorrow, but they will not be doing remote teaching tomorrow with their students. So tomorrow, the parents will have to know that there is no remote education for elementary school for tomorrow. They will still that is correct. We'll make sure that the right emails and communication is sent because we have two, two sets. So staff, as you leave and you're communicating with folks, make sure they're sending the right communication so that we don't confuse people. We want, we basically, that's what your recommendation said, was that elementaries come back on the 12th, Th that and is secondaries come back on the, or others come back on the 13th. That is correct. Okay. The Stan, uh, no, Julie Hedrick made the motion yeah. and Stan Research seconded it. I'm seeing no, co no comments, so let's vote, starting with uh, Ernestine. Ernestine Crable, District 3. <laughs> Lost what I, where I where, li live. <laughs> uh, yes. Julie Hedrick, District 2, yes. Cheryl Logan at large, yes. Stan Research, District 4, yes. Ben Blankley, District 1, no. Um, Mike? Mike Rohde, District 5, no. Ron? Ron? Ron Rosales, District 6, yes. Okay, motion passes 7 2. 5 2. 5 2. I beg your pardon. 5 2. I, I'm with you, Ernestine. It's getting late. 5 2. <laughs> I apologize. <laughs> uh, all right, I think that ends this discussion. So next item, Mike. Continuing under operations, 2021-22 district calendar.
The proposed 2021-22 district calendar is being submitted for review and approval. It is recommended the board ad adopt the proposed district calendar with August 12, 2021 as the first day of school and May 25, 2022 as the last day of school. And the board members do have the calendar at the table. And Ron and Mike, do you have this calendar in front of you? I do. Okay, I just wanted to make sure no, you were looking. Okay, yes. can would somebody send it to Ron electronically? It's in the email that he received. At okay, it's in the email that you received from Mike Willamy. With the agenda? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes, and I have it. Okay. Are there questions, concerns on this calendar? The calendar committee met. Ron, you were part of that com calendar committee, were you not? Correct. Is there anything that you want to say to us about the calendar? I think he's disconnected. Yes. Are you there, Ron? Because it sounded like you may have dropped off. Okay, I think we've lost Ron, but he'll call back in. Okay, are there any questions or concerns on this? And they, you are asking uh, th that we approve this tonight, is that correct? Yes. Okay. I have a question. Ernestine? Is there any reason why the urgency that we have to adopt this tonight and we couldn't postpone it to the next meeting? Uh, I mean, it, it doesn't matter. I mean, this is our typical time of doing this work, but if you're overwhelmed and you can't, can't do this, then that's fine. But, and I'm overwhelmed, so it's all good. Uh, but I'm just saying, this is typically our time, and we try to get this out so that parents can right. start making plans and arrangements for what they, they you know, how they you know what, what they want to do so I confess that I was so busy looking at all the other issues on our agenda that I didn't even look this over so I have no idea I would really be voting blind I would if it's possible I would like to have it on the next agenda and have it in effect like this is our first reading and that next time be our yeah we, I, I'm getting the heads up from Sean that it won't hurt to move it to February so what we can do is we can call this a first read and it'll be final read and uh, acceptance or rejection next time. Thank if you. you see, as you have a chance to look through this calendar, anything that you want to think we need to know about, would you please notify the superintendent? Then she can get that information out to the calendar committee and to us. Okay. Yes, Stan. Stan Reeser, District 4. Uh, we could also, we are also having a meeting on January 25th, aren't we? That actually has been canceled. That's when ha we have canceled that one? Yes. Okay. I was going to be announcing that later, but yes, that, uh, uh, there's really not a need for it. And if this can wait till February, then we'll do that. Sounds good. Okay. Next item. Under finance, none submitted miscellaneous superintendent's report. I have none. <laughs> okay, next item. Board of Education report requests. Do you have anything, Ernestine? None. <laughs> Julie? None. The only thing I want to do is that the special BOE meeting that was scheduled for Monday, January the 25th has been canceled unless something comes up that we need to reschedule it. But as of now, that is off of our calendar. Uh, Stan? Stan Reeser, District 4, no reports. Ben? Uh, ben Blankley, District 1. I just have a short kind of cool thing. Um, since we ended, you know, we had winter break here. Um, my my five-year-old's uh, school typically does a, like, all-school music program. Um, and they still did this year, um, even though it was, you know, uh, everyone was remote. Um, so everybody dialed into the same... Uh, team's presentation and the music teacher was there and the accompanist was there and the and the school mascot was there and and it was just a it was it was a really cool uh, neat way of continuing uh, that kind of a tradition in a very uh, a weird circumstance so uh, so thank you to uh, to my kids school and not, and any of the other uh, schools that that found ways to continue traditions during this difficult time we have very creative teachers. 
Uh, Mike, do you have anything for board report and requests? I have no reports. Um, Ron, have you rejoined us? Yes, yes, sorry about that. Okay. Um, yeah, I just wanted to echo what um, Mr. Polite, Mr. Reynolds said earlier as a uh, proud product of Cloud Elementary and Horseman and North High. I really appreciate their input and everything they were saying earlier. Uh, but that's about it. Thank you. Uh huh. Thanks. Okay, next item. New business. I am seeing none. It, do you, Ron or Mike, do you have any new business? I have none. I have none. Okay, next item. Executive session. Julie. I move the board recess into an executive session for purposes of consulting with the board's attorney who will provide advice on a matter concerning pending litigation and on another matter concerning pending litigation. Pursuant to the Kansas Open Meetings Act, exception is allowed under KSA 754319 and the board return from executive session to this room at 10:15. Okay, there is a motion on the floor that we moved into executive session. Is there a second? Ben Blankley, District 1, I second. Okay, the motion was made by Julie Hedrick and seconded by Ben Blankley. Please cast your vote, starting with Ben. Ben Blankley, District 1, yes. Stan Reeser, District 4, yes. Cheryl Logan, uh, at large, yes. Julie Hedrick, District 2, yes. Ernestine Crable, District 3, yes. Mike? Mike Rohde, District 5, yes. Uh, Ron? Ron Rosales, District 6, yes. Okay, and the two of you, you will be joining us remotely again with the speakerphone that's in the conference room. Okay? Thank you, and we... Thank you. Yeah. We, we are adjourned to, we are dismissed to executive session. I call the meeting back to order. The next item, Mike. Adjournment. Move to adjourn, Julie Hedrick, District 2. Stan Reeser, District 4, second. A motion was moved by Julie Hedrick, seconded by Stan Reeser that we adjourn the meeting. Please cast your votes, starting with Ben. Ben Blankley, District 1, yes. Stan Reeser, District 4, yes. Cheryl Logan, at large, yes. Julie Hedrick, District 2, yes. The meeting is adjourned.